Number two, confusion and misinformation about the Godhead and the Trinity. Let me tell you, probably after this sermon, Magdiel Perez Schultz, my extremely able assistant, he's the one who receives, or Marilyn Perez, my executive assistant, they will receive messages. Why did Wilson say that? Wilson is wrong. I want to tell you today, I am telling you from my perspective what the Bible says. The Trinity, Seventh-day Adventists believe there is one God and that this one God is three co-eternal persons who work together in unity. We fully embrace our fundamental belief number two, which indicates that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always been and always will be. Make no mistake about it. The divine trinity work in unison as one within the Godhead from eternity to eternity. Allow God to use you, every one of you, to share this wonderful truth of a triune God who is carrying out his plan of salvation for each of us. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Let me get a quick drink of my tea here. I want to give a big shout out to Banner of Truth. No, this is not uh, paid advertising. Though you guys can reach out to me if you would like. I'm a big supporter of Banner of Truth. But big shout out to Ted Wilson as well for that great introduction as tonight we will be examining the Adventist pioneers in light of their views regarding the Trinity as well as who they believed Jesus Christ to be, what you could call Christology. There has been a growing rift within the uh, SDA sect for quite some time over this exact issue which you could kind of pick up there from what Ted said is going to happen. Some of you may have seen it. We looked at all of that address a few months ago, which uh, that clip was obviously pulled from. And he was addressing this issue because it is growing within their movement. It is something that will never be resolved, though, unless the roots of the movement are sprayed with uh, theological glyphosate, if you will, and killed until they are ready to renounce their pioneers. This problem will persist. But it's important that we address this because, as we also heard, Ted wants us to believe, like many others in their movement, that they are Trinitarians now. I've said, and I will continue to say, this is just Christianese. And what I mean by that is, it is the borrowing of Christian language, but meaning something entirely different. We heard, for example, how the Adventist heavenly trio is one in a mission and purpose, and that's what makes them one God, supposedly. But being united in a mission is not what makes monotheism monotheistic, which is why the Christian church, who was led by God early on, developed language around this subject that articulates with specificity what the scriptures are saying on this subject. At the end of the day, that's what matters at least on this platform. What does scripture teach and what do we mean by the words that we use? Not just that we use all the right words, which is key. And that's precisely uh, what we will be starting by doing before conducting the funeral service of the pioneers. But to get specific, we obviously always on this platform love to start with a thesis. One of the central claims of the SDA church is that we're supposed to believe that God raised them up as his last day people to restore the fullness of apostolic Christianity. We also saw that from Ted Wilson last week. So our thesis for tonight is going to be answering the question, are these the individuals who the true God, the triune God, raised up to restore his church as his end times remnant people? Are these the individuals that God raised up to restore his church as his end times remnant people, because that is a central claim of theirs. 
Now, Ted mentioned some other things, which we'll also look at in conjunction with the subject, such as the uh, plan of salvation. But we will look at that more closely toward the end as we wrap things up. This is going to be a very long presentation, folks, but a very important one. It has been in the making for a long time, and it just needs to, to be done in one sitting. So that's just the heads up, the disclaimer. It is going to be a long night. We will start by laying out the fundamentals of the Trinity, the biblical basis for such. Then we will look at our SDA sources in light of the biblical witness. The stuff I am sharing tonight is not unique to me. This is not answering Adventism's uh, fancy. This is not something I just came up with. Um, sharing is caring. I say that a lot on this platform. That's what's happening here. Sharing is caring. I stand on the shoulders of giants. So we have lots of sources to look at. But before doing that, I got to tell you guys about a new thing on the channel. Our member section is now live, which means you can join and gain access to exclusive content. And as things move along, other tiers will be added, uh, which will include things like merchandise, private Q&A sessions, community hangouts, and a whole bunch more, depending on how things go. We get a lot of people wanting to talk on the phone, Zoom calls, etc., and there is just no possible way to meet all of those requests. I want to meet them. I always feel terrible when I can't with people, but there are just so many that it's not realistic. That would be my full-time job if I were doing this. Um, which is why we will soon be expanding the membership tiers to include one that will have a weekly Q&A, as well as potentially some one-on-one -on -one type sessions, etc. Again, I get a lot of Christians as well that want to have long discussions regarding how to reach people apologetically in their community and so forth. So click the members link down in the description box if this is something of interest to you. It'll take you to the YouTube homepage where you can sign up directly to what you see on your screen. You can become a member and get plugged into some of the new avenues we plan to explore, uh, mainly around connecting with the audience more. It is hard to do that in these presentations without getting sidetracked. I'm notoriously known for being uh, rather long-winded or verbose sometimes, um, and so it is hard to uh, engage with the audience during these presentations without them being uh, a lot longer than they already are. But I do want to interact with you all more, and we will be doing a lot more uh, stuff and interaction in the members community. So to start, breaking the ice on all of this. On this subject, folks, there is something you have to understand. And that is the difference between the doctrine of the Trinity and the biblical evidence for the Trinity. Anti-Trinitarians of all stripes get confused in this area, which leads to all sorts of faulty conclusions and ideas. So first, the doctrine of the Trinity is not the biblical evidence, like I said. The doctrine refers to the language and words that the Christian church has used to accurately describe what the Bible teaches about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The language is used to describe the Godhead. So the examples, being and persons. Those words are used for very specific reasons. When you hear the argument, those words, that's, that's not in the Bible. This is the doctrine of the Trinity. It is the language that we are trying to use to accurately convey what the Bible is teaching in clear, in, in, in like a more formalized and clear, accurate representation of what's there. The biblical evidence, on the other hand, is looking at the Bible in its entirety to see what it says regarding Christ, the Father, the Holy Spirit, their characteristics and attributes, etc. So it is pointing to biblical passages. But the doctrine may use language. Yes, the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. That's not the claim. That's not the point. It doesn't need to be in the Bible. We talked a little bit last week. There's no example of a woman taking communion in the Bible. That doesn't mean women should not take communion. It doesn't mean the Bible doesn't teach that women should take communion. So understand the distinction between the doctrine of the Trinity and the biblical evidence for the Trinity. When people use those silly arguments like the word Trinity isn't found in the Bible, they're conflating and crossing wires. For one, neither is the word Bible. 
So they just shot themselves in the foot. But second, it doesn't need to be. Again, that's not the claim. Because what we mean when we use the, the word Trinity is found in Scripture. The word is simply a summation word to summarize a lot of information. So we use language such as person and being to describe areas of unity and areas of distinction. What you really, when you're getting technical, is the one in the many. So in order to accurately describe that, theologians, the church, essentially through the years, dealing with heresies like Arianism, Semi-Arianism, Eutychianism, Gnosticism, have used words, per, the, the words person and being, to distinguish areas of unity and distinction, both of which we do see in the Bible. God is both totally united, but there is also a distinction regarding the Father not being the Son, the Son not being the Spirit, the Spirit not being the Father, etc. So to distinguish between these areas and remain precise, we use certain words to convey that without falling into polytheism with multiple gods or a Unitarian position where only the Father, for example, is the eternal God, um, something to that effect. So that is one. Understand that the doctrine of the Trinity is not the same as the biblical evidence for the Trinity. We will be looking at both. So the doctrine of the Trinity specifically is this. In the most simple of terms, within the one being that is God, there exists eternally three co-eternal and co-equal persons, namely the Father, Son, and the Spirit. Did you notice that Ted in the introduction? Now, I'm not saying that he did this purposefully or what have you. I'm just making a, a recognition. And this guy has a bad track record, folks. He just made a video for the SDA Church's YouTube channel a couple weeks ago where he described the, the Trinity as modalism. <laughs> so I'm not sure. I, I think Ted is a good parrot, but I don't think Ted actually is a good theologian. But did you notice in the introduction, he did not say that they are co-equal. He said co-eternal persons, but formally speaking. Within the one being, that is God, there exists eternally three co-equal and co-eternal persons, namely the Father, Son, and the Spirit. So God is one singular being, and that one being exists in three co-equal, co-eternal persons, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. When we use the words person and being, this is what we mean. Person refers to the conscious ability to will, speak, self-reflect, exhibit emotions, etc. Being refers to the mode or state of existence. You have to understand this distinction here. This cup has being. It does not have personhood. I have being and personhood. I'm one being, one person. In a lot of people's minds, person is synonymous with human or human being. That's not the way it's being used here. Human beings are both one being and one person. Angels also have personhood and they are not human beings. Spirits have personhood and are not human beings. So when Christians say we believe in the three co-equal, co-eternal persons, that is what we are referring to. Father, Son, and Spirit can all speak, self-reflect, exhibit emotions. That's what we see in Scripture. They are all conscious. When we use the term being, we are, referring to, we are referring to the mode of something or someone's existence. I'm one person, one singular being, but God is three persons, one being. There's only one mode of existence that is God, one singular being. That the, the is, the I am. And that one being is shared by these three persons. They're not, it's not 33%, 33%, 33%. No, no, no. This, the one being, the one God is Father, Son, and Spirit. They're not self-existent. It's not three standalone self-existent. We'll get into all that. But another way of thinking of this is that the being describes the what of God. And the persons describe the who. So there's one what, three who's. So the three doctrinal pillars of the Trinity look like this.
There is one being that is God, monotheism. There are three divine persons, and the three persons are co-equal and co-eternal. This is why, folks, the language around person and being is so important. And when they balk and scoff and say, oh, that's Greek philosophy, or that, they don't understand the issue. That it has nothing to do with any of that. You're also pointing at people that lived in a different time period and then faulting them for their time period. It'll be interesting to see if, if the world goes on for 500 more years. This movement's not going to be around if things go on for 500 years. Is it really imminency if it's been 700 years? <laughs> you know? So if it goes along for 500 more years, um, would it be fair for the people, if the movement's still around, for people, Adventists in the future, to point back to Adventists of this day, 500 years removed, and say, oh, that's, that's American philosophy? Well, yeah, because the movement was born in America. So there's certain aspects that uh, these, these excuses are irrelevant because what matters is what's really being said, the substance of what's being said, and that is present in the text. I pointed out how recently the SDA church updated their website regarding the Trinity. That was in a short that we put up on the website uh, or rather on the YouTube channel. Uh, it used to say they believe God is three eternal beings. They switched this to three eternal persons, but it says nothing regarding the being. Tritheist folks believe in three persons. Tritheism, groups that believe in three gods. They believe in three persons. So you have to say, well, no, it's three three persons, one being. So only saying three persons doesn't mean that they are Trinitarian. They refuse to add that God is only one being. And the excuse that I've heard is, well, we just don't use that language because the Bible doesn't. Well, the Bible doesn't say God is three persons verbatim either, but they have no problem saying that. The real reason for this will be made evident once we get into looking at the pioneers and the way that they used language, most specifically Ellen White. But that is the doctrine of the Trinity. We will look at the biblical evidence in a moment, but there is another aspect of this discussion that we uh, that has to be understood, and that is the economics and ontology of God. Now, these might sound like big, fancy words, etc., but they're really, it, it, we'll get into that. This is where people will often get confused because they say they, they see Jesus the Son doing something distinct from the Father, for example, like the incarnation or dying on the cross, and they struggle to see how Jesus could be completely equal with the Father then. This is because there are two ways of discussing God and his doings. The economics of the Trinity refers to the roles that each person of the Godhead assumes in redemptive history. So the Father did not incarnate. The Son did. The Holy Spirit did not die on the cross. The Son did, etc. The difference in that context is in function. That does not make them unequal in being, which is what ontology is. The, 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 the science of being. So when we talk about the ontological trinity, we're talking in the context of who God is at the being level. When you talk about the economics of the trinity, you're talking about how each person functions differently in redemption. Which is why we have the ontology of the trinity, or what some theologians will call the eminence of the Trinity. I M M A N E N C E. Imminence, not like the imminent return, but immanence. This refers to God's actual being without regard to his works of creation and redemption. So the ontological structure of the Trinity is a unity, Deuteronomy 6 4, the Shema. When we speak of the economics of the Trinity, on the other hand, we're dealing with the activity of God and the roles of the three persons regarding creation and redemption. The reason that this is important to understand is because we have to think in proper categories. There are times people will point to distinctions within the Godhead, and they don't recognize it's a distinction in function, not being. That's the key. This also gets into what's called the, the hypostatic union, 
the two natures of Christ ascribed to the single person. He is the God man. He's fully God, fully man. We see divine attributes ascribed to the Lord Jesus, like we will see momentarily. But we also see human attribution ascribed to the same person. He gets tired. He has to go to the bathroom. God doesn't have to go to the bathroom. So people will often say, I'm not saying SDAs will say this, but anti-Trinitarians oftentimes will say things like, so you're saying if Jesus is God, how do, God doesn't have to sleep. God doesn't get tired. Right, because the unique son of God in the incarnation is both fully man and fully God. So in his humanity, of course he got tired. Of course he, he was truly human. But he's also truly God, like we're going to see. The, the Bible also ascribes divinity to him. So oftentimes I say that to say people will point to these things, these, dis, these differences or these things that seem human, to say, well, God doesn't get tired, etc. And it's because they don't understand these things are ultimately in the context of the economics of God, not the being of God. So when Jesus, for example, submits to the will of the Father and suffers as the suffering servant, Isaiah foretold, you'll get people that will say, this shows Jesus isn't ontologically equal with the Father. But no, this is a distinction in function and role, not being. Jesus willfully chose to assume that role from eternity past as the suffering servant. The Father didn't do that. The, the Spirit didn't do that. But that doesn't mean that in their being, they're not equal. These two categories simply help us keep categorical distinctions clear and to not muddy the waters. Now, when it comes to the Adventist heavenly trio, which is the term Ellen White used to refer to the Godhead, what makes them one is not their ontology. The heavenly trio is three distinct persons who all possess their own distinct being. It is three persons, three beings, which is why they are functionally tritheous. The key word being functionally. They're going to insist and tell you, no, we're not. No, we're not. But functionally, they have three gods with the Father alone being the Almighty, which I will back up with why I'm saying this. But as Ted mentioned in that opening clip, and as uh, can be seen on their website, they teach what makes their gods uh, what makes their gods one is a mission and a purpose. Notice what Ellen White says regarding this trio. This is from a very long titled "Testimonies for the Church Containing Messages of Warning and Instruction for Seventh Day Adventists," page sixty three. Quote. The comforter that Christ promised to send after he ascended to heaven is the spirit in all the fullness of the Godhead, making manifest the power of divine grace to all who receive and believe in Christ as personal Savior. There are three living persons of the heavenly trio. In the name of these three great powers, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, those who receive Christ by living faith are baptized, and these powers will, co will cooperate with the obedient subjects of heaven in their efforts to live the new life in Christ. Close quote. God is not a trio, folks. Nor is God three great powers. But this is how the Adventist God, God, is one. They are united in the plan of salvation and cooperate with those who decide to be obedient in bringing about a person's new life in Christ. We looked at some of that last week, their hyper synergistic system. Now notice though what she says regarding Jesus's existence. Quote, this is from Signs of the Times, August 29, 1900, 15 years before her death. Christ is the pre-existent, self-existent Son of God. In speaking of his pre-existence, Christ carries the mind back through dateless ages. Close quote. Adventists will bicker amongst themselves over statements like this, folks. The anti-heavenly anti trio crowd says, she's simply affirming what some of the pioneers did, that Jesus' beginning was so far in the distant past you could basically call it eternal. 
the pro-heavenly trio crowd, try saying, this proves she claimed that Jesus has always existed. More on this when we look at the pioneers. But the issue with this statement, folks, is no, Jesus is not self-existent. And I've yet to meet the SDA that understands the severity of this claim. I'll explain this now with a visual aid. The Trinity shield on the left is a common graphic that is used to convey what Trinitarians are saying. Not a three-leaf clover, that's modalism, or even getting into Eutychianism, parting out God. But you'll see there is a connectedness and a plurality to the triune God. The Father isn't the Son, the Son isn't the Father, yet they are all one singular being. The Father is not self-existent, the Son is not self-existent, the Holy Spirit is not self-existent. The three persons make up the one God. Again, the Father isn't 33%, the Son another 33 etc. There's no division at that level. The one God is Father, Son, and Spirit, and that one being is self-existent. Just like at the, at the baptism of a believer, they are baptized, the, the initiation into the church is in the name of the one God. The name, singular, Father, Son, and Spirit. God is not like anything in creation, folks. We don't know the inner workings and mechanics of how God is the way he is. Scripture does not tell us all of that. And honestly, that's part of the beauty of the triune God. He is unsearchable, such that the depths of who he is will leave us in awe and wonder for all of eternity. The Adventist Heavenly Trio, on the other hand, are three distinct beings, self-existent alongside one another, and what makes them one is not their being and state of existence, but their mission and purpose, which this is what their website still states. They believe these three beings, this trio, works together like a team in the plan of redemption, and they're united on that plan, so therefore, that makes them one God. But no, that, that's not one God. That would be like saying if the Greek pantheon, Zeus, Athena, etc., if they were real, hypothetically, and they weren't all fighting for supremacy, but they united in a mission where they were never at cross purposes, that all of a sudden now you have one God, <laughs> which is an actual example we will look at momentarily from one of their scholars. So all of that to say that is the doctrine of the Trinity in a nutshell, the doctrine, as well as the distinction between the economics and the ontology of the Trinity. With that laid out, now let's look at uh, let's look at the biblical evidence for the Trinity. What was essentially examined by the church very early on. This is old, folks. This is not this is not new, which is why this is such a big issue because when you come along in the 19th century and claim that Christians have been worshiping an idol for nearly 2000 years, yeah, you're going to have some serious problems. But let, let's look at the biblical evidence now. That's what was looked at by the church to arrive at this language and, and, and presentation. I'll start by saying this will be by no means exhaustive. <laughs> the whole presentation could be on example after example after example of Scripture, hundreds of examples. And we could spend the whole night on that. But let's establish from Scripture that the Father, Son, and Spirit are all the one eternal God, the Almighty. Okay? Let's start with Jesus being the Almighty. Notice what Jesus says in Mark 2, 1 through 11. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he, talking about Christ, was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing, bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not near him, be, and when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. 
Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And thus the reading of God's holy word. Something important to catch before we get into breaking this down. When scripture uses the phrase, in his spirit, to refer to Christ, that is the author speaking about his divine nature. When they use the phrase, according to the flesh, that is them referring to his human nature nature, such as in Romans 1-3 and uh, Romans 9-5. But notice, in this encounter, Jesus forgives the paralytic sins, he knew what was in the hearts of the Pharisees, and he healed the physical and spiritual disease of the paralytic. He not only healed him physically, he, he healed him spiritually. So three things Jesus did in this one single encounter. Well, 1 Kings 8.39 says that Yahweh alone forgives sins. Psalm 44.21 says God knows the secrets of the heart. And Psalm 103.2-3 says Yahweh Jehovah, the Almighty, heals diseases and forgives sins. Jesus does all three in this single instance, hence why the Pharisees, who would have been familiar with the Old Testament, said what they did. Only God can do what this man is claiming to do. But this shows that Jesus is not some lesser divine being. Now, Isaiah says that Yahweh is the first and the last, the only Savior. Notice Isaiah 43, 10 through 11. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord. The Lord there, that's Yahweh, the Almighty. Not some, not like Abraham was referred to by his wife, Sarah, who called him Lord. No, that's lowercase l, Lord. This is the Almighty, Yahweh, Jehovah. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, lowercase g, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, the Almighty. And besides me, there is no what? Savior. Yahweh is the only Savior. And then notice Isaiah 44, 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, the, the King of Israel, and the Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. Who is speaking, folks? The Almighty. Besides me, there is no God. Just said that the previous chapter. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declared it? And are you, not, and are you my witnesses? Is there a God besides me? Capital G. Is there an Almighty besides me? So not only does Yahweh say, there's not even an idol that's like me. You're not even going to find another Almighty that is like me. There's no rock, capital R. I know not any. Thus the reading of God's holy word. So Yahweh clearly tells us he is the only God. There are none besides him. He's the first and the last, the only Savior, only Savior. He's the only rock, which is a recurring image in the Old Testament for God, capital R, rock. Well, folks, Jesus explicitly states that he is the first and the last, the Almighty, multiple times in Revelation alone. Notice all the passages referring to Jesus and Jesus speaking. 
calling himself the first and the last, Alpha and Omega, the Almighty. Revelation 1.8, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Same chapter in 17 and 18. You'll get some people say, that's not Jesus speaking in verse 8. Okay. When I saw him, this is John, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me saying, fear not. I am the first and the last, the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. It's Jesus, folks. That'll be read in your red letter Bible. Yahweh just told us through Isaiah. He's the first and the last. There's no God beside him. He's the Almighty. Jesus is the first and the last. Revelation 2.8, again, Jesus speaking. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right, this is him telling John, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. We're told in Titus 2.13 that Jesus is our great God and Savior. Did Yahweh say it through Isaiah? He's the only Savior. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what's called a Granville Sharp construction. You'll get people that try to claim, no, 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 no. The great God is referring to the Father, and then Savior is referring to Jesus Christ. Yeah, that backfires on you. Yahweh says through Isaiah, he's the only Savior. So it doesn't work. Nice try. 2 Timothy 1.10. And which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life, ah, has the keys of death and Hades and immortality to light through the gospel. Which means if according to Isaiah, Yahweh alone is the first and the last, the only Savior, that means Jesus is the Almighty. Not just this, but Yahweh says he alone is the only rock. What does Paul tell us in 1 Corinthians 10? For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers, the Israelites, were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. That's the Red Sea. And were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate of the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock, capital R, that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Jesus was with Israel in the Old Testament, and he was the what? The rock. Remember in Numbers, Moses striking the rock, or actually not striking the rock when he was supposed to. That was a type and a shadow of Jesus being struck and bruised for our iniquities. He was that rock. Living streams of water poured out of the rock. The rock was a picture and a type of Christ who was there and was present. He was that spiritual rock. But Yahweh says through Isaiah that he alone is the rock and there are no others. Jesus is Yahweh. Again, Isaiah 44, God through the prophets, same chapter we were just in, tells us a number of things. But first notice, Isaiah 44, 24. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone, alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself. So the word Lord here is the name of God translated, Jehovah, Yahweh, whatever you prefer. The point being, it is the Almighty, not simply a Lord like David was called, lower, lowercase l. But the Almighty says that he alone stretched out the heavens and made all things. He did this by himself. Yahweh is also the believer's redeemer. We just saw that in the previous chapter as well. Or savior, if you will. Which he said in the previous chapter, there's only one savior. Well, looking at the entirety of the biblical witness, which is how the Trinity is arrived at, Paul and John both tell us that Jesus made all things. But just a couple of places out of a plethora regarding the work of, uh, work of creation. Colossians 1, 15 through 17, and Hebrews 1, 10. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, notice that folks, by him, 
all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. This is talking about Jesus. And Hebrews 1.10, again, talking about Jesus. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. Not some lowercase L, Lord. No, no. This Lord is the Almighty who laid the foundations of the earth. <laughs> and the heavens are the work of your hands. <laughs> we will get to the term firstborn later. But notice, all things were not merely made through the sun, like early SDA pioneers and other cults like, like the Jehovah's Witnesses try and say. Paul says all things were made by Jesus as well. He laid the foundations of the earth. Well, Yahweh through Isaiah said that he alone made all things. Which means Jesus is almighty. Like I said, we could spend all night looking at Jesus' parallels and how he is Yahweh. But that proves such. This doesn't even get into the fact that Deuteronomy 6 says that the Lord, our God, is one. Well, Ephesians 4 says there's only one Lord. Jesus Christ, the Lord. But the Father is also called Lord and the Spirit is called Lord. Evidencing that the one Lord is the Almighty, Father, Son, and Spirit. But that's the evidence that we'll look at tonight for the Son being Jehovah. Now notice what the Almighty, also who's, who said this through Isaiah in 64, 8 says. But now, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. It's like what we see in Romans, Romans chapter 9. The Father was also involved in creation, which means the Father is also Jehovah, Yahweh. Father and Son both created. Now, I've yet to run into the person that denies the Father is the Almighty. <laughs> so in the interest of time, we will let that suffice. I don't think, I mean, if you're going to make that argument, all right, we're going to move along anyways. Now, what about the Holy Spirit? This is a big one, folks, because lots of people, and we're going to get into this, try and say, well, the Spirit is, is Jesus' Spirit, or the Father's Spirit. It's... Genesis 1, 1 through 2 says that the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters, followed by himself acting in creation. So when creation began, the Spirit is already present. But the term hovering is very important. It actually has to do with being active in creation. How do we know this? So notice Genesis 1, 1 through 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. But now notice Deuteronomy 32, 11, which says that Yahweh is like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. So, like an eagle that hovers over its nest, feeding its young, caring for them, etc., so God hovers over his people. You can look this up, as I have, and that's why I know this. The same verb is being used in Genesis 1 about the Spirit that's used here in Deuteronomy. Meaning, the Spirit was doing the same thing over the earth at creation. Evidencing that the Holy Spirit was also involved in creation, and He also is Almighty, since the Almighty alone created all things. Yet, the Father, Son, and Spirit are distinguished from one another at some level. For example, in John 14, 26, Jesus says that when He ascends back to the Father, the Holy Spirit will then be sent to comfort them. Jesus doesn't say he'll send his spirit to comfort them. 
or the Father will come to comfort you. No, no. The Holy Spirit is sent from the Father and the Son at the ascension of Christ. When Jesus is baptized, the Spirit descends on him in the likeness of a dove, the Father speaking the, the blessing over him at his baptism, and the Son is there in the water. The Spirit is not the Spirit of Christ. It's not the Spirit of the Father. The Spirit is a distinct person. The Spirit is referred to with personal male pronouns. He is a person. He has the ability to act, will, speak, be spoken to, etc. So, for example, in Acts 21, Acts 21, 8 through 11, we see that the Holy Spirit can speak. It says, On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came from Judea. And coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit. This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Very clearly, Agabus spoke, or, or the Holy Spirit spoke through Agabus. We also read in Romans 8, 26 through 7. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who does what? Searches hearts. What did we see earlier in 1 Kings 8? God, Yahweh, the Almighty, is capable of searching hearts. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Or sorry, that's, that's the Psalms. That God is the, the Almighty is the one who searches hearts. Lots of anti-Trinitarians, including tons of Adventists, like to try and use the argument that the Holy Spirit is either Jesus' spirit or the Father's spirit. When no, very clearly he is distinguished from both. But he's called the Spirit of the Lord, all caps, L-O-R-D, and the Spirit or the Spirit of Yahweh, which we will look at shortly. But it makes no sense, folks, to say God knows the mind of the Spirit if the spirit of, if the spirit is god the father because that would be saying god knows his own mind <laughs> furthermore how can the holy spirit know how to intercede for us if he isn't a person he's referred to as a he and himself he prays for all believers simultaneously knowing their struggles and he can pray for all of them simultaneously that is a divine attribute show me a human that can do that or a creature that is a divine attribute and shows he is omniscient and omnipotent. Now let's look at this even further. Specifically, the Spirit of the Lord. Acts 5 is a bazooka. It is a pneumatological, which is just the study of the Holy Spirit. It is a pneumatological bazooka. It just ends the, the discussion. Praise God for the Apostle Peter. In Acts 5, when Peter's rebuking Ananias and Sapphira, notice what he says. But a man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard it 
the young man rose or the young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. So Peter tells Ananias he didn't lie to man, but to God. And the Holy Spirit is who he lied to, which means the Spirit is God. Even further demonstrated in the fact that he tells Sapphira they tested the Spirit of Yahweh, the Spirit of Jehovah, the Spirit of the Lord. This is the same Spirit, or rather, Spirit of the Lord, sorry. This is the same Spirit of the Lord that Samuel in 2 Samuel uh, 23, 2 says spoke through him. Again, evidencing that the Holy Spirit can speak. He isn't just a force or a procession. Spirit of Yahweh. Now that was only a sampling. But this is why the Christian church believes in the doctrine of the Trinity. Because when we look at Scripture in total, we see that the Father, Son, and Spirit are all Yahweh. But they have a level of distinction that makes them different. Economically, in the plan of redemption, the Father didn't die on the cross. The Father didn't incarnate. The Spirit didn't die on the cross. The Son didn't descend on the Son in the water at the baptism. Yet at the same time, they're all Yahweh. So to, uh, to effectively communicate this, we use the language of person and being. That's why they are such important distinctions. Simply saying three persons is not enough. A tritheist can say the same thing, folks, and then say, well, we're monotheists, based on how Adventism tries to, to do it. Mormons are polytheists, and they'll tell you they believe in three persons. Yet they believe in a vast number of, of an innumerable number of gods. They'll say, oh, well, the, the Trinity is the three gods of this planet. We only worship those gods because they created our planet, but there's all sorts of other gods out there. So person and being, I, I just, they're so important in this and necessary in this discussion. Whenever they use these silly, that's, that's a, you know, I, I, it depends who you talk to, but it's like you can talk to some of their scholarly ones and it's like, oh, well, that's that's Thomas Aquinas. And it, it's just so laughable. It, it's so laughable. It's like, stop trying to pawn this off on like all the favorite boogeymen. Like, oh, that's Roman Catholicism. Oh, that's, that's Greek philosophy. Oh, that's Aristotelian. No, deal with what's being said. D deal with what's being said. But in light of all of this, I want to now transition into looking at some statements from SDA history professor Jerry Moon from Adventist uh, Andrews University. This is going to take a bit, but it's necessary before we examine the pioneers because it will give us a good background regarding development, especially for those who are unaware, and show us where they claim to be now. We heard in that clip earlier, Ted used all the right buzzwords. We believe in three persons, co-eternal, co uh, the Trinity. This examination will show us what they mean by those words before then jumping into the pioneers, which is the roots. Okay. First, notice what Mr. Moon admits. I'm going to get a drink here real quick. So from his book, The Trinity, Understanding God's Love, His Plan of Salvation, and Christian Relationships. Notice what he, he says here. I want to start by, by looking at this. More recently, talking about in SDA history, a further question has arisen with increasing urgency. Was the pioneer's belief about the Godhead right or wrong? As one line of reasoning goes, either the pioneers were wrong and the present church is right, or the pioneers were right 
and the present SDA church has apostatized from biblical truth. Thank you, Jerry, for the honest and forthright admission. Because that is very sound logical reasoning, because that's exactly correct. Until they are ready to denounce their pioneers as heretics, this problem in their movement will persist. It will never happen, though, because to do so would be to undermine the entire foundation and the whole house of cards falls down. So instead, we get a, a hybridized version of, well, we've changed, but we still try and retain some of these core things from the pioneers because, well, they're the things Ellen confirmed. But this admission also verifies our thesis statement. Because if what Moon and modern SDA theologians claim, which is that the pioneers were wrong and the modern movement is correct, then the inverse of his conclusion is true. The pioneers were apostates who didn't believe biblical truth. Which would mean they weren't raised up by God to do anything other than serve as an example for us of what not to do. This statement also shows that it is obviously no secret within the leadership ranks that the SDA pioneers were not Trinitarians. But there we have it. Either the modern day SDA church has apostatized or the pioneers were wrong on this issue. The present SDA position is correct and the pioneers were apostate heretics who had a false God. Doesn't necessarily mean that the, the current organization is correct either. I think they're both wrong, but his syllogism is correct. Which would mean that no, God did not raise them up to restore his church. Now, in his paper titled The Quest for a Biblical Trinity, something I've referenced I don't know how many times, we also find some other pertinent uh, scholarship. And the reason we take the time to look at these sources, folks, instead of me just instead of me just saying it, is because Adventists will try and tell you, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I make stuff up. I misrepresent them. All these sorts of excuses. This paper is available in the description box down below for those that want to follow along. Okay? Open up the description box. There's the link there. Bring it on up. The page numbers will be on the screen for you. You can follow along and see for yourself. Check my homework. See if I'm twisting things. I'm taking stuff out of context. All these sorts of excuses. Don't just take my word for it. In this paper, he lays out the historical track record of the SDA church's position on the Godhead and how it evolved over time. He opens the paper with this paragraph. Quote, in 1846, James White dismissed the traditional doctrine of the Trinity as the old unscriptural Trinitarian creed. A century later, at the 1946 World Session of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, the denomination that James White co-founded voted official endorsement of a fundamental belief statement that explicitly professed belief in the Trinity, quote-unquote. During the 60 years that have passed since that action, a Trinitarian view of God has remained dominant amongst Seventh-day Adventists, despite the general awareness since uh, Roy Gaines' master's thesis in 1963 that most of the earliest Adventist leaders were non Trinitarians. Close quote. So as I mentioned, their scholars will tell you outright, the pioneers were not Trinitarians, but staunchly stood against Trinitarianism. Some of them, such as Moon, try to say, well, a lot of them reformed in this area and came around because of deeper biblical study. This is not true, as we will see. But I also want you to notice the wording. He says, during the 60 years that passed since the endorsement of the heavenly trio in the fundamental beliefs, a Trinitarian view of God has remained. And this is key, a Trinitarian view. Because notice what he then goes on to say. In previous research, I have traced the development of the Adventist doctrine of God 
from opposition to the Trinity doctrine as traditionally formulated to acceptance of the biblical concept of one God in three persons. I have also traced the clear progression of in Ellen White's visions from 1850 onward, showing that her visions gradually formed her concept of God until by 1898. When she published Desire of Ages, she held a Trinitarian concept. So catch that. He recognizes that the Adventist view of God developed over time. So God raised up people who rejected who he is to restore his church and gradually gave them more light as to who it even is that they're worshiping and preaching throughout the world. Apparently, Ellen was given progressive revelation around this area and was developing in her own understanding of who God actually is. Despite the fact that the church has known who God is for 2,000 years. Yet her earlier statements regarding God are just as authoritative and divinely inspired as the later ones, despite the contradictions they'll create. This is not a good track record, uh, track record for the supposed restorers of the church. The church that never fell away, by the way. But you'll notice again, he uses the language of a Trinitarian concept. There are not multiple Trinitarian concepts. The Trinity is very specific. Get a different term. Like your heavenly trio. Stop trying to say, well, it, it's kind of a trinity. You'll see in that paper. He tries to say, well, what Ellen says, you can basically say it's the trinity. No. The trinity is something specific. You guys don't believe what, the, what, what trinitarians believe, so own that you have your own concept. You guys think this is biblical, so own it. Stop trying to use Christian language when you don't mean the same thing that Christians do. He contrasts what we believe by calling it unbiblical, and he does so by saying the pioneers rejected the traditional formulated Trinity doctrine and came to the acceptance of a biblical concept, which is just laughable because, as we just saw, the traditional formulation of the Trinity is biblical. We're using certain dot language with the doctrine of the Trinity to convey the concept more clearly. What he means here is what all of their scholars do, which is uh, that what I presented earlier is based on Aristotelian philosophy and not strictly on scripture. So therefore, it's not biblical. But notice what he also says. The purpose of the present article is to clarify more fully the similarities and differences between Ellen White's view of the heavenly trio and the traditional doctrine of the Trinity in order to discover her position in relation to the current debate amongst Adventists. Folks, right there, very clearly, the heavenly trio is not the Trinity. He keeps putting in front of it the word traditional, which is going to trigger a bunch of SDAs to think, oh, see, it has no biblical basis, it's tradition. Not even understanding, it just... All tradition's not bad. Not just that, but Adventists are full of, of tradition. Adventism is a tradition. This idea that you have no tradition is the evidence that you're a slave to tradition. But very clearly, the heavenly trio is contrasted from the Trinity. You don't get to just come along at a later point and take a term, redefine it, and then insist, no, no, we're Trinitarians just like you, brother. That's not how this works. The Trinity is a specific term that refers to something specific, like I laid out earlier. This is just more SDA word games and slipperiness to try and make it seem like they believe like Christians do, but very clearly they mean something different. There's no need for them to use the word Trinity. Trinity doesn't just mean, well, three persons. No, that's partial truth. That's like Satan in the, in the Garden of Eden. Partial truth. No, you guys need to just own, well, no, we completely reject the Trinity because we believe in a heavenly trio. These three persons who are distinct beings, wait till we see, wait till you see, folks, what we're going to get into. And you'll see what I'm talking about by that. But this is just more SDA word games and slipperiness to try and make it seem like they believe like we do when they clearly mean something different. Their prophetess was apparently inspired by God, the God she didn't actually know, and was his mouthpiece for years and years and years, but was still trying to figure out who he even was. Yeah, not looking good so far. 
Now notice what he says. The concept of God that is explicit in her later writings portrays the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as three eternal persons of intellect, will, and emotions who are united in character, purpose, and love. There is no conflict among them, no working at cross purposes, no competition, not even disagreement. Thus, they are not three gods, as in polytheism or tritheism, but one. Furthermore, their unity is not a mathematical paradox, but a rational unity analogous to the unity seen in a good marriage, where husband and wife are united in an ever-growing oneness, but without negating their individuality. Close quote. So what makes the heavenly trio one God, supposedly? They aren't working at cross purposes. That's why I said what I did earlier using the Greek pantheon as an example. Apparently, if Zeus and Neptune and all the other gods of the Greek pantheon, gods, weren't fighting for dominance but united on a mission, that would all of a sudden make them one god. That is not at all what Christians believe, folks. God is one singular being. The various gods of polytheistic religions are all distinct persons and beings. And that last sentence, by mathematical paradox, he is referring to the Christian position, the one in the many. That God is three persons, but one being. Instead, they are one in rela uh, relation like a marriage, the Adventist God is. Except no, you have two persons, two beings in a marriage. This is the classic taking something from creation and trying to import that onto God and his nature. But notice the little footnote number 13. That he that he included on there as a citation. The fact that scripture has much to say about the relational unity of God does not preclude God's ontological unity, but the ontological unity is certainly less explicit in Scripture. So he calls this a mathematical paradox and says the heavenly trio is not united in this way, but then says, well, they are, but Scripture is certainly less explicit. Okay. Is it really that shocking that this movement is a confused mess on a foundational issue like this? trying to reinvent the wheel. This is what happens when you're full of pride and you think, well, everyone was wrong before we came along. Now notice how they define the term person because this is key. He pointed out earlier that Ellen White supposedly claimed that the Father, Son, and Spirit are three eternal persons of intellect, will, etc. to which SDAs are going to say, see, we're Trinitarians, like Ted did. But notice what they mean by the term person. He continues, quote, James White certainly did not doubt that God is spirit, John 4, 24. But he insisted that though spiritual beings, Christ and the Father are never, nevertheless divine persons who have a literal, tangible existence. They are neither unreal nor imaginary. The Trinitarian creeds he knew of made God so abstract, theoretical, and impersonal that God was no longer perceived as a real, caring, loving being. Close quote. So by person, they mean you have a literal, tangible existence. Meaning they have physical bodies by nature. James White certainly believed that God is spirit, but because that doesn't make sense in their physicalist worldview, they just disregard that and say, God, God by nature has a physical form. Not simply that he has the ability to manifest in physical form to interact with creation, but that by nature, God has an eternal, physical, tangible body which would mean the Father's physical body has eternally existed, even though physical matter isn't eternal. 
That's getting into like Mormonism. But notice how in their view, if something isn't able to be distilled down into their simple way of thinking, it must be imaginary. Oh, I know Jesus says in Luke 24 that spirits don't have flesh and bone. I know that scripture says God is everywhere. But we're still going to say God is a physical, tangible being because that's the only thing that makes sense to us. A bunch of 19th century heretics who thought they were smarter than everyone else. But folks, the the Bible uses all sorts of imagery to describe God. (laughs) It isn't all to be taken literally every time. We just looked earlier. Does God have wings and feathers? Is he an eagle? (laughs) Jesus says he's the door. He's the vine. This sort of like literalistic reductionism of the pioneers and their inability to understand what they were reading, whether it be the Bible or even the Nicene Creed, that is the root of the issues. These people had no clue what they were talking about. And the SDA church has their whole thing around, you know, they have to have this big idea around, well, the Bible is just simple. It's written for the common man. There's a deeper root behind all of that. It's not just them saying that. It's because, well, they have to have that because their pioneers were those types of people. William Miller was that type of person. So everything has to be this real, it's, it, it just got overcomplicated by those, you know, Roman Catholics that confused everyone. It's that sort of thing that's going on. there. But notice, James White associated the Trinity as abstract and imaginary. And because he personally felt that way, that makes it so. (laughs) Totally bad reasoning. But with this definition of person in mind, now look at what Jerry Moon says regarding Ellen's supposed vision where she talks to Jesus. Quoting from her vision, quote, I have often seen the lovely Jesus, that he is a person. I asked him if his father was a person and had a form like himself. Said Jesus, I am in the express image of my father's person. Thus, her visions confirmed what her husband had written in 1846, that the father and the son are two distinct, literal, tangible persons. The visions also disproved to her mind the claim of the Methodist creed that God is without body or parts. Thus, these early visions steered her developing view of God away from creedal Trinitarianism, though they offered nothing directly contrary to her later statements of what I have called biblical Trinitarianism. Close quote. Again, when they say person, they mean tangible literal, physical forms. And Jesus has the identical form as God the Father. There are two of those. And notice, what influenced her theology? Scripture? No, no, visions. It all goes back to visions. That's the ultimate deciding factor in the development of this system of theology and the understanding of God. Theology proper. Theo meaning God, ology, you know, the study of God. What God supposedly revealed to Ellen as the stamp of approval. We also see a lack of understanding regarding the Nicene Creed, stating that God is without parts and, and body. <laughs> the, these pioneers th- thought that 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 meant he's imaginary and not real. Again, the physicalist worldview completely clouding the ability to understand. Because no, that's not what the creed is saying. Notice what R.C. Sproul says regarding this phrase. This is in his exposition of the Westminster Confession of Faith, which affirms the Nicene Creed. So commenting on the phrase, God is without parts, that part of the creed. What is it saying? Quote, this is one way to affirm what is called the simplicity of God. God is a simple being rather than a complex being who can be divided into parts. A human being, for example, is a complex being with a head, ears, eyes, a nose, arms, feet, and various organs. Parts. 
When we seek to understand God, we tend to project our human complexity onto his being. We list his attributes, immutability, eternality, omniscience, omnipresence, holiness, and others. We tend to think that God is made up of one part holiness, one part immutability, one part omnipresence, and several other parts. But all of God is all of his attributes in their entirety. Close quote. Folks, without parts in the creed has to do with God being indivisible. <laughs> he is who he is. He's not 25% love, 10% just, 5% omnipotent, etc. That's what the creed is laying out. But these ignorant pioneers that damned everyone else to perdition and claimed we're confused, were themselves confused, and thought it was uh, uh, it, it was talking about God being a disembodied imaginary creature because he doesn't have ears and a nose and he's not like 50% you know love and 20% just etc but because the SDA movement rejects divine simplicity and claims it's a greek philosophical construct they end up even further off in the weeds espousing a tritheistic monarchian view that's like a blend of polytheism with three gods, but the Father alone is the Almighty. This is so silly. Just because God doesn't ontologically have a body doesn't mean he's not real. <laughs> Again, this just assumes their physicalist worldview. Because now, notice what Moon goes on to say regarding their prophetess's understanding of the Holy Spirit developing over time. Quote, in the 19 or in the 1890s, 1890s. Oh, sorry, I got the wrong slide here. Oh, I don't have this slide. Excuse me, folks. In that case, I will just read it to y'all. Sorry about that. In the 1890s, when she became convinced of the individuality and personhood of the Holy Spirit, she referred to the Holy Spirit in literal and tangible terms, much like those she had used in 1850 to describe the Father and the Son. Close quote. That's on page 150 of that paper in the, descrip the description box if you want to check that out. But this means that prior to the 1890s, all the supposed revelations she received from the one true God didn't involve understanding that the Holy Spirit is a conscious person. <laughs> Yet the Holy Spirit, who is the Almighty, is the one that inspired her, supposedly. <laughs> but not until the 1890s, folks. That's 30 years past their incorporation date of 1863. She didn't just say that the Holy Spirit also has a tangible, literal form, but notice... The Lord instructed us that this was the place in which we should locate. We have had every reason to think that we are in the right place. We've been brought together as a school and need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, remember how they define person, is walking through these grounds unseen by human eyes, that the Lord God is our keeper and helper. He hears every word we utter and knows every thought of the mind, close quote. That's from Manuscript 86 in 1899, speaking about the Battle Creek campus. But get that, folks. They rejected the Nicene Creed because it made God seem imaginary or unreal, but the Holy Spirit has a physical, tangible form and walks around, but is invisible. <laughs> get that. Physical matter, but it's invisible. Walking around on the earth. Yeah. But it's Christians that supposedly have an imaginary view of God because we don't think he, by nature, has a physical body from eternity past. The Holy Spirit's walking around. The Holy Spirit has legs and is walking around, but it's invisible. Yeah, which one of us sounds like they have an imaginary friend? When they use the term person, understand that's what they mean. It is not what Christians mean. It's that there are three tangible forms, the Father and the Son looking identical, and all three of those persons slash beings 
the term is used interchangeably, are one God because they're united in a mission, like we looked at on that chart. But finally, Mr. Moon concludes with this. The change from Adventist rejection of the traditional doctrine of the Trinity to acceptance of a biblical Trinitarian doctrine was not a simple reversal. When James White denounced creedal Trinitarianism in 1846, Alan White agreed with both his positive point, that the Father and the Son are two distinct literal tangible persons, and his negative point, that the philosophical Trinitarianism held by by many did spiritualize away the personal reality of the Father and the Son. Soon after this, she added the conviction, based on visions, that both Christ and the Father have bodily form, rejecting the teaching of one Trinitarian creed that God is without body or parts. Close quote. So on top of all of the other issues, where does he say this development came from? That's right, visions. <laughs> Just like Ellen asserted earlier, not scripture. Their stamp of approval on the correct understanding in all of this came from visions, not the Bible. They can huff and puff all they want, but it doesn't change the facts. Just like all the other beliefs, James came to this belief around God having a physical body by nature. Not just that, Jesus added unto himself a human nature at a point in time, but that God eternally. It's not just that Jesus added unto himself a human nature at a point in time, but that God eternally possesses a physical body. All three, Father, Son, Spirit. Ellen then has a vision that confirms this, where she talked face-to-face -face with Jesus. She had an HR meeting up in heaven in the temple. And Jesus confirmed to her, that not only does the Father have a physical body, but it's identical to that of Jesus's. This is then used as the stamp of approval from God that James was correct on his position. That's what they mean by, oh no, it's all from Bible study. James was studying, came to some conclusion, or some other pioneer studying and comes to a conclusion. Ellen conveniently has a vision, and that confirms, oh yeah, you're correct in your understanding. So it's just biblical. Yeah. And then they'll read off their script, their, their script of proof text and claim it's biblical because they have some verse they can point to. But ultimately, it's because Ellen had a vision, and that's the ultimate thing that cements the idea in. She's like the magic, the, the magic eight ball for the pioneers. But what I wanted us to gain from that before looking at the pioneers was to showcase a couple things. Here's a recap. One, SDA scholarship clearly recognizes and admits that the pioneers were anti-Trinitarians. But now the claim is, no, 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 we've reformed. We've changed. We officially believe in the Trinity now. Two, no, their current position is a hybrid position between tritheism and monarchianism, where you have three beings that are all God, the Father alone being the Almighty, and what makes them one is a mission where they work as a team to try and bring a plan of salvation about. Three, they do not mean the same thing by the terms person and being that Christians do and will claim that's Greek philosophy and just dismiss it, even though the substance of what's being said is biblical, like we looked at. Four, their gods all have a physical, tangible form and walk around like a man. But the Holy Spirit and the Father are invisible to the mortal eye. And then five, they have stolen the word Trinity to try and sound like Christians, but very clearly they have their own flavor or version of the Trinity. A concept, that's what Jerry Moon used, a concept of the Trinity. But they believe and think that what Christians believe is unbiblical. 
Yet lots of SDAs will deny this, even though Moon very plainly said they reject what Christians believe, traditional creedal Trinitarianism, which is based on scripture, and they claim it's unbiblical, and that the SDA church has a biblical view of the Trinity, aka the heavenly trio. They are not Trinitarians. They need to stop lying and saying that they are and own up that they are heavenly trioists. Totally different concept in idol that's not real. And it's based on the vain imaginings of a woman in the 19th century that thinks she talked to Jesus face to face in vision. But Jerry Moon's paper clearly settles uh, uh, our, our, our thesis for the night. But now, despite that, Let's begin our exam of the pioneers and why people like Jerry Moon have sought to distance themselves from them, but why the anti-heavenly trio folks in their ranks want to see their movement return to the pioneers. The folks who think the SDA movement has been infiltrated by Jesuits that were that, that planted the Trinity in the SDA church. Okay. First up, J. N. Andrews. The man for whom Adventist uh, Andrews University is named after. And where Jerry Moon works. Notice what he says. Quote. The doctrine of the Trinity, which was established in the church by the Council of Nicaea, AD 325. This doctrine destroys the personality of God and his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Remember what they mean by that phrase, the personhood or personality. The infamous measures by which it was forced upon the church, which appear upon the pages of ecclesiastical history, might well cause every believer in that doctrine to blush. Close quote. No, it wasn't established at Nicaea, sir. This is the problem yet again with these pioneers. They had no clue what they were criticizing. Nicaea was where an official statement was put forth and the Arian heresy specifically was denounced. You think it just arose in the fourth century? It just like, bam, it just totally ridiculous, dude. It's literally built. I mean, we can go back and look at Ignatius has early, early, early. We're talking about an individual who knew the apostles. It's like looking back through history from where you're currently at and just missing and dismissing so many things and acting like, oh, it just arose in the, the fourth century. And Nicaea was where an official statement was put forth and Arianism was denounced. It was the result of Christological heresies that the church was already dealing with prior to Nicaea that resulted in the church having to formally lay out what biblical orthodoxy actually is on this subject. Which makes complete sense because even in the days of the apostles, folks, it's in scripture. You already had Christological heretics creeping in. Read the epistle to, to uh, 1 John. You already had Gnostic heretics creeping in that were like, we had a variety of views under the Gnostic umbrella. Jesus isn't really a human. He's a projection of light from heaven, kind of like the rays of, of light from the sun are. They're a projection from the sun but they're not really like, he doesn't have a physical, actual corporeal form because the physical matter is tainted. These are the sort of things the Gnostics were saying. This was around during the days of the apostles. It makes perfect sense that God would then lead his church in denouncing such heresies and silencing them, which is, which is exactly what happened. Nothing to do with it being forced this is a lack of understanding real church history striking again. And notice, the Bible is clear there is only one Lord, the Almighty. We looked at that. So he calls Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which would mean the Father is not Lord, the Almighty. And Jesus is some, he, either Jesus is the Lord, the Almighty, and the Father's not. Or Jesus is some lesser Lord, like you see Sarah calling Abraham. There's no other way that his statement could be understood because he's rejecting Nicene creedal Trinitarianism, which says Father, Son, and Spirit are the one Lord. Yet here he's calling Jesus Christ Lord, and the Bible says there's only one Lord. So either he has to be, in, in, your, in J. and Andrews' case, some lesser Lord, lowercase l, 
or this guy just doesn't understand the Bible. But then post the, the SDA movement's incorporation after 1863, after the, what they want to be the forgotten years, 1844 to 63, he says this in their church paper. And as to the Son of God, he would be excluded also, for he had God for his father and did some point at the eternity of the past have beginning of days. So that if we use Paul's language in an absolute sense, it would be impossible to find but one being in the universe, and that is God the Father, who is without father or mother or descent or beginning of days or end of life. Close quote. That is the Review and Herald, September 7, 1869. Ah, so Jesus, who is Yahweh, like we looked at, according to this guy, had a beginning. Only the Father is truly eternal. No, sir. Jesus is the first and the last, the great I am, the eternal God. This is blasphemous heresy. Now, before moving on, remember what Ted Wilson was warning us about in that opening clip. He said people are going to be messaging his secretary and assistant after his talk to ask uh, why he was in favor of the heavenly trio. His response? Because he's convicted. It's what the Bible says. Remember that. It's what the Bible says. Now listen to what he went on to say less than five minutes later. Okay? Mission has always been a part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The first missionary to be sent from the church was John Nevins Andrews, one of the finest biblical scholars the church has ever produced. One of the finest biblical scholars the church has ever produced. One of the finest biblical scholars the church has ever produced. He was also a general conference president. So after warning people about anti-Trinitarian or anti-Heavenly Trio people, he praised Jay and Andrews as what? One of the best biblical scholars their church has ever produced. <laughs> he was an anti-Trinitarian heretic. And you named one of your higher ed institutions after him. Gee, Ted, I wonder why you're going to have people emailing you. I wonder why you guys are so confused. And I'm sure they emailed your assistant and said the same thing. The guy that says Jesus had a beginning and only the fathers without big beginning of days is your guys' best scholar to date? Yet you just warned earlier about people who reject the eternality of the Father, Son, and Spirit. My good riddance, man. So Jay and Andrews, heretic. Now for Uriah Smith. This guy helped systematize SDA theology. Him, James White, and Joseph Bates primarily. This is from the October 28, 1890 issue of the Review and Herald. The same decade Ellen White's visions corrected error on the Holy Spirit all of a sudden being a person now. From under the heading that asks, is the Holy Spirit a person? Quote, are we to understand that the Holy Spirit is a person, the same as the Father and the Son? Some claim that it is, others that it is not. That was the question someone asked. Answer, the terms Holy Ghost are a harsh and repulsive translation. It should be Holy Spirit, Hagion Numa, in every instance. This Spirit is the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit being the same whether it is spoken of as pertaining to God or Christ. But respecting the Spirit, the Bible uses expressions which cannot be harmonized with the idea that it is a person like the Father and the Son. Rather, it is shown to be a divine influence from them both. The medium which represents their presence and by which they have knowledge and power through all the universe when not personally present. 
Close quote. He is parroting Ellen White, which is the stamp of approval from God, that it has to be biblical. Notice. Desire of Ages, page 669. Quote, The Holy Spirit is Christ's representative, but divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. Cumbered with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was for their interest that he should go to the Father and send the Spirit to be his successor on earth. No one could then have any advantage because of his location or his personal contact with Christ. By the Spirit, the Savior would be accessible to all. In this sense, he would be nearer to them than if he had not ascended on high. Close quote. Remember, what do they mean by the term person or personality? Physical, tangible form. So the Holy Spirit is apparently Christ's representative, but without the physical form. He doesn't, remember she said, three persons of of intellect, will, etc. The Holy Spirit is that, divested though of all those things, and is Christ's representative in his absence. And she claims that with with his physical body, Jesus couldn't be omnipresent, which is why the Holy Spirit was supposedly sent, so that Christ would be with every believer accessible to all. Hey, Jerry Moon, you told us that the God uh, that was developed into the Desire of Ages was the accurate representation of the Adventist God. Well, this does not jive with the idea that the Holy Spirit has a physical, tangible form walking around on the earth, but is invisible. Yet your prophet has said both of those statements are from God. (laughs) And just so we're clear, this is precisely what the Adventist Believe Fundamental Beliefs book says also. Quote, Jesus asserted his omnipresence with the assurance, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 20. And where two are gathered where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. Matthew 18, 20. Although his divinity has the natural ability of omnipresence, the incarnate Christ has voluntarily limited himself in this respect. He has chosen to be omnipresent through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Close quote. When people like Jerry Moon say they developed a biblical doctrine of the Trinity over and against the unbiblical, philosophically rooted position that Christians affirm. What he really means is, over time, Ellen White clearly didn't know what she believed on the Spirit, and uh, and, and she was supposedly, in, uh, or she, she wasn't, uh, she didn't know who it was that she was actually in contact with. <laughs> and since she claimed it all came from God, they have to try and make it all work which is precisely why you have multiple camps in their movement bickering back and forth with one one another, pointing to the same sources for their position. But no, that's not what John 14 says. Jesus does not refer to the Holy Spirit as himself divested of a physical form. The Holy Spirit is a person and he is distinct in personages or personage from both the Father and the Son. Jesus is also not limited in his omnipresence due to the incarnation. Now, let me demonstrate such. Okay? From an article on our website, you can check this out. If you just go to our website and type in any of the keywords you see in this title or even anything in the body copy, it will pop up and you can bring it up yourself. But let's start down here at Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. You can type in any of this, and this article will pop right up. But notice, Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Contrary to Ellen G. White teaching that the Father is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Jesus is both fully man and fully God, what's called the hypostatic union. This means that Jesus possesses all of the divine attributes, which includes omnipresence. 
Jesus did not limit his divine attributes by incarnating. Proponents of this sort of thinking, thinking typically assert this by misinterpreting uh, Philippians 2, 6 through 8, what's known as the kenosis heresy. This passage does not say that Jesus set his divinity aside and chose to incarnate, but rather that he added unto himself a human nature by leaving his heavenly abode, his rightful estate, and he humbled himself as a servant by subjecting himself to the law, Galatians 4.4, 4, to redeem creation. Jesus demonstrates his omnipresence while incarnate, to Nathanael in John 1, 48 through 9. Philip, called by Jesus to follow him, realized Jesus was who the law and the prophets foretold of, the Messiah, so he thought or he sought out Nathanael to tell him. That's John 1, 43 through 5. Upon hearing this that Je about Jesus the Messiah, Nathanael asks if anything good can come out of Nazareth because he's in disbelief. That tells you a lot about the city of Nazareth. He then finds Jesus and asks him how Jesus knows him, and Jesus tells him he saw Nathanael under the fig tree. Astonished, Nathanael believes that Jesus is the Messiah, King of Israel. This astonishment is because Jesus wasn't physically present when Nathanael was under the fig tree where Philip found him. Yet he was able to see Nathanael while not being physically present. Jesus even says, if this is what won him over, he will see things far greater than that. John 1.50 Jesus didn't claim to just know where Nathanael was, which is omniscience, but that he saw him. One would have to be present where someone or something is to see it. Another example is in Mark 7, 26 through 30, where Jesus drives the demon out of the Syrophoenician woman's daughter. He honors the woman's faith that Jesus was capable and able to do so. Without being physically present, Jesus drives the demon out of the woman's daughter. Mark 7, 29. He is the one doing the driving out of the demon, not the Holy Spirit yet he wasn't physically present. This shows that Jesus' incarnation did not limit his divine attributes. A third example, one of the strongest, is the encounter that Jesus has with the official in John 4, 46-54. The man begs Jesus to come and heal his son, John 4, 47. Jesus then tells the man to go, his son will live, John 4, 50. The man then leaves, and along his journey home, his servants meet him to let him know the boy is living, John 4, 51. They tell the official that it was yesterday at one in the afternoon that the boy was healed, John 4, 52. It was at that moment that the official remembered that was the exact hour the previous day that Jesus said, to the, or that, Jesus said that the boy would live, John 4, 53. The man's journey was more than a day away, yet Jesus healed the boy at the moment of his declaration without physically being present to do so, demonstrating his omnipresence despite his human body being limited to space and place. It is Jesus doing these healings and before the Holy Spirit is sent as another helper in John 14, 16 through 18. Jesus would have to be present to do these healings, which means his omnipresence was not diminished by incarnating. Scripture is clear that Jesus is immutable and does not change. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. So now, the Adventist church has a different Jesus and a different spirit both of which Paul warns us to be on the lookout for in 2 Corinthians 11, 1-4. But now, notice what else Uriah Smith says. Quote, this is from Looking Unto, Unto Jesus, page 10. God alone is without beginning. At the earliest epoch when a, big, when a beginning could be, a period so remote that to finite minds it's essentially eternity, appeared the word. 
in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. John 1, 1. This uncreated word was the being who in the fullness of time was made flesh and dwelt among us. His beginning was not like that of any other being in the universe. It is set forth in the mysterious expressions, his, God's only begotten son, John 3, 16, the only begotten of the father, John 1, 14, and I proceeded forth and came from God, John 8, 42. Thus, it appears that by some divine impulse or process, not creation, known only to omniscience and possible only to omnipotence, the Son of God appeared. And then the Holy Spirit, by an infirmity of translation called the Holy Ghost, like he said earlier, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, the divine uh, afflatus and medium of their power, representative of them both, Psalm 139, 7, was in existence also. Close quote. Eh, wrong. Do not pass go directly to jail. John 1, 1 does not say that in the beginning the word appeared. And by the beginning, John means a point so far in the, the distant past, it's basically eternity. There's lots out there, folks, on the grammar and construction of John 1, 1, A, B, and C. You can go check that out for yourself from actual sound theologians of various traditions. But catch the confusion here. Jesus wasn't created. No, no, no. He had a beginning, though. Known only to omniscience, the Son of God just appeared. But he wasn't created, folks. Such a mess. But it's Christians that are confused. Got it. He says at a point so far back into the past, we can't even fathom it. Jesus had a beginning. And that's what John 1.1 1, 1 is supposedly saying. And he tries to use the word begotten to support this. We will look at that with regards to a different quote in a bit. But no, that is not what the term monogonase means. But here we plainly see... The Holy Spirit is the power and representative of both the Father and the Son in their physical absence. He is not a person. And at this time, you had Ellen White confirming this nonsense in visions, which is what propagated it as legitimate. Then, over time, as Jerry Moon pointed out, there's new light and insights that she receives that contradict previous understandings, and it's just blanketed over as, present truth and new light from God. Total doctrinal mess. And it's a, just a bunch of ancient heresies resurrected, claiming to be new insight from God and claiming everyone else is clueless, confused, in the dark. They've been, they've been swindled by Roman Catholicism. Yeah. Again, same book, Looking Unto Jesus. Quote, when Jesus left heaven to die for a lost world, he left behind for the time being his immortality also. But how could that be laid aside? That it was laid aside is sure, or he could not have died. But he did die as a whole, as a divine being, as the Son of God, not in body only while the Spirit, the divinity, lived right on, for then the world would have only a human savior, a human sacrifice for its sins. But the prophet says that his soul was made an offering for sin. Isaiah 53, 10. Close quote. Ah, the same Isaiah that told us Yahweh alone created all things, that Yahweh alone is the only savior, apparently supports the idea that Jesus came into a, a being, or, or had a beginning rather, at a point in the distant past is a distinct being from the Father, and when Jesus died, both his humanity and his lesser divine nature than the Father also died. But Christians are confused, folks. Christians are the ones that are confused. But here we have a Jesus that isn't the Jesus of Hebrews 13. That's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Christian position can actually deal with this. When you understand the hypostatic union, that 
the divine person of the word added unto himself a human nature. He didn't set anything by divinity aside or, or any part of his divinity aside, but rather added unto himself a human nature such that he didn't actually change. He's still immutable. There's no divine attributes being set aside, being limited, being turned off like a switch. No, it doesn't work that way. This is, again, where divine simplicity comes in. God is who he is. There's no like, well, Jesus is God, but he turned this off. And, you know, he's not omnipresent fully now. And like, this is breaking God into a bunch of parts. But we also clearly see that Smith didn't understand the hypostatic union. The two natures of Christ in the single person, which, as we will see later, the SDA church emphatically asserts they now believe. Instead, we get a kenosis type Jesus, which we will look at more closely in a, in a different quote. And yes, to make matters worse, this is the same Uriah Smith that had this to say regarding the atonement. And no, the SDA church hasn't denounced this, to my knowledge. Quote, The death of Christ and the atonement are not the same thing. And this relieves matter of all difficulty. Christ did not make atonement when he shed his blood upon the cross. Let this fact be fixed forever in your mind. Close quote. Yeah, what I'm going to have fixed forever in my mind is you are a damnable heretic who has no clue what the hell you're talking about. What a blast. Only a demon would say something like this. What a blasphemous statement. Only a fool would say such a thing. For a movement that wants to point at everybody else and say, they're all confused, they're all lost. Yeah, okay. Let that fact forever be fixed in your mind that the atonement and the death of Christ are not the same thing. Wow. When Christ shed his holy blood on the cross, he didn't atone for your sins. That was only where the atoning sacrifice took place. That's what they teach. And why is this the set in stone understanding? Because of Uriah Smith? Of course not. It's what Ellen White claimed to be shown in vision, which is their stamp of approval from God, that they were understanding everything correctly. The infamous Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 357, quote, the blood of Christ, while it was to release the repentant sinner from the condemnation of the law, was not to cancel the sin. It would stand on record in the sanctuary until the final atonement. So in the type, the blood of the sin offering removed the sins from the penitent, and it rested in the sanctuary until the day of atonement. Close quote. This is wicked, demonic doctrine, period. And no, as we've looked at many times, the sins of penitent people were not transferred in type by the blood of the sacrificed animals into the sanctuary to be stored until the Day of Atonement, which is what she also claimed in the same book. Notice, again, another article from our website. Did the high priest carry the blood of sacrificed animals into the holy place every day? In Patriarchs and Prophets, as well as elsewhere, Ellen White falsely asserted that during the daily ministration of the priests in the holy place, the blood of the sacrificed animals was carried by the priest into the holy place and sprinkled before the veil, and that by this ceremony, the sin was, through the blood, transferred in figure to the sanctuary. This contradicts the Bible where we are told that apart from the once a year day of atonement service, the priest only sprinkled blood before the veil in the holy place, meaning taking the blood into the holy place on two occasions. When the priest sinned, Leviticus 4, 3 through 12, and when the entire Israelite community sinned, Levit Leviticus 4, 13 through 21. Blood was never taken into the holy place on a daily basis when one of the leaders sinned, Leviticus 4, 22-26, nor when an individual sinned. Ellen White had no clue what she was talking about. So no, yet again, she contradicts scripture 
and the light from the lesser light contradicts the greater light. So all of that to say, Uriah Smith, heretic. James White, husband to the prophetess and another key player in systematizing SDA theology. First, notice what he says in the February 7, 1856 issue of the organization's paper, the Review and Herald. Quote, the mystery of iniquity began to work in the church in, the, in, in, uh, in Paul's day. It finally crowded out the simplicity of the gospel and corrupted the doctrine of Christ, and the church went into the wilderness. Martin Luther and other reformers arose in the strength of God and with the word and spirit made mighty strides in the Reformation. The greatest fault we can find in the Reformation is the reformers stopped reforming. Had they gone on and onward, Till they had left the last vestige of papacy behind, such as natural immortality, sprinkling, the trinity, and Sunday keeping, the church would now be free from her unscriptural errors. Close quote. So like we saw last week with Ted Wilson, we see the claim that the Christian church apparently went apostate immediately after the apostles and beginning with Martin Luther, the Reformation was the beginnings of what would lead to a restoration, the SDA church being the fullness of that restoration, supposedly. No, folks, that's not what was going on there. But we even hear the Anabaptist claim, <laughs> the problem with the reformers is they stopped reforming. AKA. They believe things the SDA pioneers claim aren't biblical, so therefore they're not. The reason Luther didn't go on to reject the things that James White listed are because they're biblical. Those aren't things that aren't, pro those are, those things are not problematic. But amongst that, he lists the Trinity, of which he errantly claims is a Roman Catholic popish invention. Hey, James. Then why does the Eastern Church also universally affirm the Trinity, or should I say the Eastern Churches? These pioneer folks had zero concept of the Eastern uh, branch of the Church. Which, honestly, as far as they were concerned, they were probably like, oh yeah, those people aren't even Christians. Yeah, it wasn't Roman Catholicism that corrupted the doctrine of Christ. <laughs> I'm Reformed, so obviously I have my theological differences with Rome, but what a joke. Once again, we have an SDA pioneer faulting Rome for the very thing they themselves are guilty of. It never ends. The SDA church loves to claim that they're true heirs of the Reformation because they're the only ones that kept reforming. But what that really means is they're a mess of a bunch of various theological heresies as well as various contradictions because they're not, they weren't integrative thinkers. The Reformation didn't even begin with Luther. Ellen would go on to write the Great Controversy uh, 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 after this quote, <laughs> but she, she tried starting with the Waldensians, but it didn't start there either. I talked about this a, a little bit last week. St. Francis of Assisi, for example. Now you're going to get Rome claiming that, well, St. Francis didn't exit out of fellowship with the Pope and, and, and rebel against the Pope, etc., but... The point being is, is pointing to Luther as like, oh, it started there. It's like, well, that's just, that's not really true. That's kind of a caricature of history. But St. Francis of Assisi, well before the Waldensians, he was seeking to, to reform like the decadence of the church, more in accordance with like the poverty and simple life of Christ. But nevertheless, we have another pioneer of this movement that doesn't know history, claims the Trinity is a Roman Catholic invention, and rejected something he didn't even understand. Now notice this quote. And this says a lot about where their movement is today and why they have Aryan heretics in their ranks. Quote, In the divine law and in the gospel of the, the divine son are the tests of Christian character. And it is with an ill grace that those who have been splitting up into petty sex during the 19th century, that's rich, calling other groups sex when they're a sect. Splitting up into petty sex during the 19th century over forms of church government, matters of expediency, free and restricted salvation, trinity and unity, whether we may sing any good hymn in church or only the Psalms of David, 
and other matters which constitute no test of fitness for heaven now pounce upon us and display any amount of religious horror simply because we regard strict conformity to the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus the only true test of Christian character. Close quote. October 12, 1846, issue of the Review and Herald. So get that. It doesn't matter if you have a false god. That's not a test of Christian orthodoxy. Yet he says strict conformity to the Ten Commandments is. Newsflash, James, if you don't believe in the Trinity, you have a false god and you violate all four of the first commandments. This evidence is how these heretics just up and deem themselves to be the new arbiters of what makes you a Christian, totally untethered from history, radically unhinged. And when people try and point to Luther, including Roman Catholics, sorry, Roman Catholic friends in the audience, when they try to point to Luther to say, oh, it's just this novel thing, it's just such a caricature of history. But this is another area where they'll claim the reformers did the same thing. No, they didn't. Unlike James White, the reformers had connection to the church universal in history. They weren't just rogue agents like James White bouncing from one heretical sect to the next. Then just up and deeming themselves, well, we're God's people now. This guy came from the Christian connection, folks, a restorationist Unitarian sect, then ended up in Millerism, another sect, then goes on to help establish the SDAs, another sect. Yeah, it's a real sound track record. But also, the statement aged like milk, because here we are 170 years later, and Adventists are one of the most splintered, divided groups out there. Like we looked at last week, Christians are far more united than Adventists. It's like, if they only understood the purpose of the creeds. Oh, no, those aren't biblical. Yeah, they are. So now what's your excuse? What, what aspect of the creed is not biblical? The Apostles' Creed, the Athanasian Creed, the Nicene Creed. What, what aspect of that is not biblical? We are united on the gospel and who God is, the foundations of the Christian faith. Yeah, we disagree on some areas of mechanics because, believe it or not, everything in theology is not just a cakewalk. Yeah, believe it or not, it's, we're, we're talking about the most complex aspects of all of reality. Believe it or not, it's not all just this idea of, oh, the Bible was written for the common man. Where are you getting this? Yes, yeah, some aspects are the general basics for what a person needs to know to be made right with God. But theology is vast, man. It's just silly to think such a thing. Adventists can't even agree on if it's okay to eat chicken. If going to the movie theater is okay. What proper dress reform looks like if you can go to a restaurant on Saturdays before the sun goes down. And literally countless factions and splinters depending on your geographical location. Yet they're the bastion of unity amongst all of us, confused, deceived Protestants and Catholics and Roman and, and Eastern Orthodox. Now to the next quote. If you tuned in last week when we broke the Great Controversy chain, you're going to notice where Ted Wilson got some of his talking points from regarding Jude. Quote, Beloved, when I have all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Jude 3 and 4. The exhortation to contend for the faith delivered to the saints is to us alone. And it is very important for us to know what for and how to contend. In the fourth verse, he gives us the reason why we should contend for the faith, a particular faith. For there are certain men or a certain class who deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. The way spiritualizers have disposed of or denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ is first using the old unscriptural Trinitarian creed that Jesus Christ is the eternal God. Though they have not one passage to support it, while we have plain scripture testimony in abundance that he is the son of the eternal God. Close quote. Ah, so remember last week, Ted Wilson cited uh, Jude 4 and said this exact 
same thing. See where he got it from? The faith once for all delivered to the saints is what the SDA church is heralding and that alone. Again, notice his distinction between the God, uh, uh, God the Father as Lord and Jesus as Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not a Trinitarian, which this fellow was not, then you have two Lords when Scripture says, no, there's one Lord, which circles us right back to having to say Jesus is some lesser, lowercase Lord, like an earthly king, which is precisely what this guy taught, as you can see. He claimed Jesus is not the eternal God. This is also the quote Jerry Moon referenced in his paper. The old unscriptural Nicene Creed can't be supported with one passage of scripture, supposedly, demonstrating that Jesus is the eternal God. Moon claims that James White would go on to reform on this. No, he didn't, as we will see momentarily. But how ironic. Jesus isn't the eternal God, he says, and he cites Jude 3 and 4, which he talks about the faith once for all delivered to the saints and that Jude exhorts defending the true Christ. Well, had he bothered to think before writing such a blasphemous statement, he would have seen that Jude says regarding the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 5, what he, what's he say? That Jesus led Israel out of slavery in Egypt. That's Jude 5. So after establishing, there is a faith that was deposited by the apostles. That's what they were contending for. There are people who have crept in trying to lead people after a different Jesus. He then goes on to give examples of the true Jesus. And in Jude 5, he says, This Jesus that we believe in led our forefathers out of the wilderness. Jude begins to describe the deeds of the true Christ to identify the true one. Well, what does Deuteronomy 5.15 say regarding who led Israel out of slavery in Egypt? This is the fourth commandment, ironically, in the second giving of the law. Quote, You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm. Therefore." The Lord, the Lord, your God, commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Ah, so the Almighty did this work. The Lord God, Yahweh, Jehovah, not some lesser Lord, which means, which means Jude believed that Jesus is the Almighty, the eternal God, which means James White had no clue what he was talking about and was a heretic that believed in a false God. But now notice what he went on to say a mere six years later in the Review and Herald. Quote, To assert that the sayings of the, of the Son and his apostles are the commandments of the Father is as wide from the truth as the old Trinitarian absurdity that Jesus Christ is the very and eternal God. What a blaspheming heretic. Just even reading such just makes me... And as the faith of Jesus embraces every requirement peculiar to the gospel, it necessarily follows that the commandments of God mentioned by the third angel embrace only the ten precepts of the Father's immutable law, which are not peculiar to any one dispensation but common to all. Close quote. So not only does he blasphemously, uh, blasphemously claim Jesus isn't the eternal God, but he says that Jesus didn't give the Ten Commandments to Israel. Only the Father did. It was his, the Father's, immutable law. Uh, no, James, like we just saw, Jude 5, says Jesus led Israel out of slavery in Egypt. When we look at Deuteronomy 5, where this is documented regarding the second giving of the law, Jesus is the one that was giving the commands. 
James relegates that distinctly to the Father alone. He alone is the lawgiver. No, it was the one true God that did this, Father, Son, and Spirit. Once again, the issue is their inability to recognize that God is not like them. He's not a man. He's not like anything in creation. That's why the incarnation is such a beautiful thing. It is God condescending down to us. They fashioned a God in their own image, to their own shame, and tried reinventing the wheel, which only led to confusion and resurrection of a bunch of ancient heresies. But notice, why is James saying stuff like this? Is it because Scripture says the Father alone gave the law? No. As we just saw, Jude recognized Jesus was the Almighty God that gave Israel the law and led them out of bondage. It is, of course, because of his wife, the prophetess. This is supposedly the divine stamp of approval from God that the Father alone gave the law. Quote, The Son of God was next in authority to the great lawgiver. He knew that his life alone could be sufficient to ransom fallen man. He was of as much more value than man as his noble, spotless character and exalted office as commander of all the heavenly host were above the work of man. He was in the express image of his father, not in features alone, but in perfection of character. Close quote. Remember what we read earlier from Jerry Moon. Ah, there it is. Remember? It's not from scripture, it's from visions. She was given better clarification from visions. Yeah. So after the fall of man, this is what Ellen claims she was shown regarding Jesus in heaven and what led to him then proposing a plan to the father that took three tries for the father to be convinced in a council meeting. We've looked at this before. But notice, she distinguishes Jesus from the great lawgiver, the Father. Jesus has an exalted status that was conferred on him by the Father. We also see that she claims the Father has a physical body ontologically. Jesus does as well. Again, their physicalist worldview clouding the picture. But regarding this exalted status, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8. Quote, God is the Father of Christ. Christ is the Son of God. To Christ has been given an exalted position. He has been made equal with the Father. He has been made equal with the Father. All the counsels of God are opened to his Son. Close quote. The fact that they will insult your intelligence by telling you this actually means Jesus is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit. That they affirm the Trinity is such a joke. It does not get any clearer than this. Go look at the source, folks. Adventists are going to try and tell you that's out of context, and then they're just going to move along. Yeah, okay. No, you're either dishonest or ignorant of your system. You haven't studied well enough. Yahweh was not exalted to be made equal with Yahweh. No councils had to be opened up to Jesus. This is the same garbage that's found in the Mormon plan of salvation, which Ellen more closely resembles and stole from very clearly. This is exactly what happened in their pre-earth origin story. There were special councils that were open to Jesus, who they both claim is Michael the Archangel, and this made Lucifer jealous, and he rebelled because he wasn't allowed to be brought into these councils. We're going to look at that more later when we get to Ellen White. But nevertheless, this is a false Christ. This is not the Jesus of Scripture, Matthew 24, 24, 2 Corinthians uh, 11, 1 through 4. This is not the God of the Bible. They can try and use whatever language they want, they can assert, oh, we're Trinitarians till they're blue in the face. It does not change the facts. They are stuck having to affirm and uphold these quotes. And because this is their ultimate commitment, they will do and say whatever they have to in order to defend Ellen White. But now notice in 1881, the year that James White died, 
Literally, the year that he died, folks. Review and Herald, January 4, 1881. Can we get any later in his life when we talk about, oh, he reformed. Quote, in his exaltation, before, before, before he humbled himself to the work of redeeming lost sinners, meaning you can't point to post-incarnation exaltation of Jesus the man to claim that's what Ellen was talking about. No, there was an exaltation before he humbled himself to the work of redeeming lost sinners. Christ thought it not robbery to eat, to be equal with God because in the work of creation and the institution of law to govern created intelligences, he was equal with the Father. Yes, after his exaltation. The Father was greater than the Son in that he was first. The Son was equal with the Father in that he had received all things from the Father. The reader may now look upon the Father and the Son to use a common figure as a great creating and law instituting firm. Close quote. So before Jesus incarnated, before, folks, before the incarnation, <laughs> when scripture talks of Jesus being exalted, it is talking about post incarnation as a man. The only man to overcome death, to redeem creation, to live accordance, in accordance with the law perfectly, etc. It's not talking about before he incarnated, there was this other exaltation. That's what they're talking about. And in that exaltation, he was exalted to be made equal with the Father, just like his wife claimed she, she was shown by God in the great controversy narrative. And it's because of this exaltation that one may look upon the Son and Father both as a common figure for creator and lawgiver. Even though previously God revealed through Ellen that Jesus was next in authority to that great lawgiver. And James was going around teaching it was the Father's immutable law, not Jesus's. But notice, the Father was greater than the Son because why? He was first. No, Mr. Moon. James White did not come around to orthodoxy. He didn't even come around to embrace where you guys currently are either. They love to point to this statement from four years prior to try and support this idea. Quote, The inexplicable trinity that makes the Godhead three and one and one and three, what Jerry Moon called a mathematical paradox, is bad enough, but that ultra Unitarianism that makes Christ inferior to the Father is worse. Did God say to an inferior, Let us make man in our image? Close quote. Folks, understand this statement in light of the one we just read from four years later. Four years later. What does James White mean by Jesus not, uh, not being inferior? There was a point in the past where Jesus came to be and was then exalted to be made equal with the Father. And it's because of that that they are not seen as inferior. That's not in harmony with what Ted Wilson said in that clip. No, this is heresy. This is not some secondary thing, folks. If you do not believe in the triumph God, you're going to go to hell. That's not me saying this. You have a false God. You have a different God. This isn't, this isn't like, should there be drums and worship music? Folks, if you don't believe in the Trinity, you have a false God. It's time to wake up. It's time to get serious about this if you're an Adventist. It's not just picking at straws here, folks. It's a serious matter. At some point, you have to draw the line. It's not just, oh, well, we believe in the Ten Commandments. Who gave the Ten Commandments? You don't even have the right lawgiver. Jesus was never exalted to be made equal with the Father prior to the creation of the earth, to then be led into some special council of God the Father and be brought into the plan of creating the earth. When they cite stuff like this, like, he, like James White does here, 
regarding let us make man in our image. Don't forget, they don't believe heavens and earth were created in the beginning in Genesis. That's only the earth and the firmament of the earth. Heaven and the angels in the universe existed long before the earth. Which is why people are often shocked to hear this because they associate young earth creationism with all of creation. But no, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is only talking about the earth. And it was prior to the creation of the earth that Jesus was supposedly brought into existence, had a beginning, but he's not created. And it's so long ago in the past that basically it seems like eternity. That's what these pioneers were saying. But as we saw, he believed that Jesus had a starting point, and that's why the Father is greater. So James White, flaming heretic. Hopefully he repented of his damnable heresy on his deathbed. Seriously. Blasphemous, flaming heresy. Next up, Joseph Bates, the other key player in systematizing SDA theology. Quote, my parents were members of, lo uh, of long standing in the congregational church with all of our converted children thus far and anxiously hoped that we would also unite with them. But they embraced some points in their faith, which I could not understand. I will name two only their mode of baptism and the doctrine of the Trinity. Respecting the Trinity, I conclude that it was an impossibility for me to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, was also the Almighty God, the Father, <laughs> one and the same being. I said to my father, if you can convince me that we are one in the same sense, that you are my father and I your son, and also I am your father and you are my son, then I can believe in the Trinity. Close quote. Fashioning a God in the likeness of man that he deems to be worthy of belief strikes again. Oh, because he deemed it to be worthy. Oh, okay, I can understand it. So therefore, he uses an analogy of two human beings and then pushes that off onto how God must be by nature. Despite God telling us very clearly that he's not like anything in creation, Isaiah 40, all throughout the Psalter, etc., God is not like creation. He is wholly other. This is also another example of why the terms person and being are so important in this discussion. Because once again, we have another pioneer claiming he couldn't believe that Jesus is the almighty God because Jesus isn't the father. Which should tell you that these folks were not very bright theologians despite the SDA church often lauding this man in particular as an incredible theologian. <laughs> They'll go on and on about how he was a sea captain and a rough and tough guy. Yeah, don't care. His theology was heretical. But also, it's rather rich that he criticizes infant baptism as being unbiblical when this is the movement that makes you take vows to the SDA organization, including to believe and uphold the writings of Ellen White in order to be baptized. <laughs> I can make a biblical defense for my position on, on infant baptism. They can't for their baptismal vows to Ellen White. Or any of them, for that matter. But another quote, a bit of a long one here. In a letter he wrote to William Miller. Quote, Much derision is made about those of our company that have joined the Shakers. Another cult from the 19th century. I say it is a shame to them first to have preached so clearly and distinctly the speedy coming of, of the Lord Jesus Christ personally to gather his saints and then to go and join the shakers in their faith that he, talking about Jesus, came spiritually in their mother, Anne Lee, more than 70 years ago. This, without doubt in my mind, is owing to their previous teaching and belief of the doctrine called the Trinity. How can you find fault with their faith while you are teaching the very essence of that never, no, never to be understood doctrine? For their comfort and faith, and of course your own, you say Christ is God and God is love. As you have given no explanation, we take it to come from you as a literal exposition of the word. Close quote. 
So I guess God's not omnipotent because that can't be fully comprehended in the human brain. I guess God's not eternal because we can't comprehend that in our mind. According to this silly standard, if man can't totally wrap their head around it, it can't be true. It's almost like pragmatism in a sense. But there we go. Yet again, Jesus isn't God. That's relegated to the Father. He continues. We believe that Peter and his master settled this question beyond controversy in Matthew 16, 13 through 19. And I cannot see why Daniel and John has not fully confirmed that Christ is the Son and not God the Father. How could Daniel explain his vision of the seventh chapter if Christ was God? Here he sees one like the Son of Man, and it cannot be proved that it, had, that it was any other person. He adds that in brackets. Here he sees one like the Son of Man, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom by the Ancient of Days. Then John describes one seated on a throne with a book in his right hand, and he distinctly saw Jesus come up to the throne and take the book out of the, out of the hand of him that sat thereon. Now, if it is possible, now, if it is possible to make these two entirely different transactions appear in one person, then I could believe that God died and was buried instead of Jesus, and that Paul was mistaken when he said, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, and that Jesus also did not mean what he said when he asserted that he came from God and was going to God, and much more, if necessary, to prove the utter absurdity of such a faith. Close quote. My, the, the, the amount of confusion. The amount of confusion. So it's entirely absurd to believe that Jesus is God. Once again, we have another pioneer who doesn't even know the basics, but is criticizing the, the, the Trinity as an absurdity. I, I can't believe Jesus is the Father. Trinitarians don't believe that, sir. I can't believe Jesus and the Father are the same person. Trinitarians don't believe that, goofball. He basically says to believe Jesus is God is to believe Jesus is the Father. So he thought Trinitarianism was modalism. Again, you guys don't know history. It's like it's like we're literally just taking a, a walk. <laughs> it's like we're literally just taking a walk through like the third and fourth centuries again. Like, dude, this was dealt with like hundreds of years before you guys were even around. And here we heard the classic Jesus is the Son of God, not God. This is why I was saying in the beginning, understanding the economics versus the ontology of the Trinity is so important. This is a prime example, folks, for you right here of an individual who didn't understand that. Well, how could we, how could it say, how could scripture say in some places God raised Jesus from the dead if he is God? Uh, I don't know, maybe the same way that Jesus himself said in John 2 and John 10 that most assuredly and without a question he would raise himself from the dead. The scriptures also say the spirit raised him from the dead. This just proves Trinitarianism. A son is still the same ontologically as their father. <laughs> so that just backfires on them. But he talks of Daniel 7 in the Ancient of Days being approached by Christ, and this is supposed to mean Jesus isn't God, he's the Son. Here we have an issue of not just understanding the misunderstanding the incarnation, but the hypostatic union. Again, we'll look at this more closely in a bit with another quote, but this objection holds zero water because it's based on just not understanding the basics. It's like these objections, it's like, dude, people were around before you, Mr. Bates. Christians were around before you. I know you guys think that you were some special selected, you know, you guys are just better than everyone else. You guys glow in the dark. You're so special. This was around long before you guys. You don't think people understood and read that he's the son of God? You don't understand what you're talking about. But anything to pawn everything off on Roman Catholicism. But at the same time, this was part of who God supposedly raised up to restore his church. All righty then. Joseph Bates, heretic. J.N. Lauborough. 
from their church paper, September 20, 1898. Notice the date, folks. 1898. It's almost the turn of the century. They love to use the excuse that all the Christological mess was cleaned up by this point. Yeah, think again, like Jerry Moon did in his paper. Well, in 1890, you know, Ellen White finally came around to understanding the Holy Spirit's a person. Yet you have this guy sent out to to parrot his ancient heresies as some new light from God. Under the heading, the Spirit of God, in this issue of the Review and Herald, This is their church paper, folks. The Spirit of God is spoken of in scriptures as God's representative. Ah, like we saw in the Fundamental Beliefs book. The power by which he works, the agency by which all things are upheld. This is clearly expressed by the psalmist where he inquires, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend unto heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Psalm 139, 7-10. We learn from this language that when we speak of the Spirit of God, we are really speaking of his presence and power. Close quote. This is in 1898, folks. The decade when Ellen White supposedly corrected all this mess. But if the Spirit of God is just the presence of God, why does he speak? If the Holy Spirit's only a a power and agency, not a distinct person from the Father and Son, then why does the Holy Spirit pray for believers? Why can he be grieved, etc.? Why is he referred to as he and himself? Why is he distinguished from the Father and Jesus both in John 14, but equated with both of them in equality? Jesus said he and the Father would send the Holy Spirit, not send their presence in their physical absence. Again, this is pneumatological heresy, a false Holy Spirit that's not real. Yet this guy was sent around to teach this to people. And again, it's always coming at the behest of, well, Ellen White confirmed it in a vision. Now, this is from a question that an SDA submitted to James White to then ask uh, Lowborough and notice his answer. Question one. What serious objection is there to the doctrine of the Trinity? Answer. There are many objections which we might urge, but on account of our limited space, we shall reduce them to uh, to the three following. One, it is contrary to common sense. Two, it's contrary to scripture. Three, its origin is pagan and fabulous. These positions we will remark upon briefly in their order. One, it is not very uh, uh, consonant with common sense to talk of three being one and one being three or as some express it, calling God the triune God, or the three-one God. If Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are each God, it would be three gods. For three times one is not one, but three. There is a sense in which they are one, but not one person, (laughs) as claimed by Trinitarians. Trinitarians believe three. Th- we believe there are three persons, but one person. If these objections were not damnably heretical, it might actually be comical. It's like, folks, you have to remember in the 1800s when this is being written, you're talking about 1400 years since the systematizing of the doctrine of the Trinity. Systematized, not invented, not discovered not proposed or any of the other misrepresent misrepresent uh, representations that you have 1400 years people have been catechizing their children in basic christian doctrine before these jokers even came onto the scene and all of a sudden this doctrine's absurd it means three gods and so on no no instead of utilizing occam's razor and realizing no it's these guys that are totally ridiculous and had no clue what they were talking about it's everyone else that's universally been wrong for 2000 years if this guy actually understood the terms person and being 
that they're not the same, he'd understand why the Trinity is not three gods. Three who's is not three what's. God is a title for the what, not the who. He goes on in his, in his response. I mean, it's a long write-up in that, that article. You can look it up. He goes on in his response to say, John 17, Jesus' high priestly prayer refutes the Trinity once again, as if the church for 2,000 years hasn't been aware of the high priestly prayer of Christ. Instead of just stopping to think, you know, those that came before me were probably aware of this pericope. I wonder what they said about it. No, no. Instead, they just asserted this silliness. Have you ever read John 17, bro? Yeah, good one. We need to understand all of Scripture in total, folks. Not cherry-picked proof texts. It's one thing to cite a proof text to, to, to say a general point. But if the general point that you're making causes conflict contextually, maybe it's time to reconsider your understanding. Because John 17 has to be understood not just with in the context of what all of John has said before John 17 in 16 chapters, but in light of all of Scripture. <laughs> the guy literally goes on to claim the Trinity is a pagan concept adapted to fit with Christianity. I mean, seriously? He says it's a Persian concept. Just silliness. Not even a serious person. It's like the equivalent of the modern-day internet conspiracy theorist that, sadly, is a victim of the Dunning-Kruger effect. Dunning-Kruger is where a person thinks they know more than they do, but they don't recognize that they think they know more than they do. All that to say, J.N. Lauborough, heretic. Next up, W.H. Littlejohn. This guy was an SDA pastor in the 1860s. He was a part of the movers and shakers like Gary Smith, James White, G.I. Butler, and so on. He traveled around preaching with them, etc. He was involved in getting the Battle Creek College back up and going. Wrote a lot about like uh, sort of the similar stuff that I do, polemical, apologetic material. This is what he said in the Review and Herald in response to the question, do you believe sins were atoned for on the cross? And this is the answer he recommends that Adventists give. Quote, I believe there's not a single Bible passage among those usually employed to prove that the atonement took place at the cross that will justify such a conclusion. The doctrine itself is contrary to reason. When sin is atoned for, it's fully disposed of and can never be charged to the account of the offender again. To reason, therefore, that the sins of those who are converted were atoned for on the cross would be to argue that such persons could not be lost. Close quote. Abject heresy. So like Uriah Smith, this guy was telling Adventists that it's contrary to reason to believe the atonement took place at Calvary. further evidencing that when I tell you guys this movement believes the cross was simply where the atoning sacrifice took place, not the atonement. I'm not talking out the side of my neck. This guy had no clue what he's talking about. For starters, scripture is clear. Clear. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Hebrews 9.22, which is a citation and quote from the Old Testament, Leviticus. Which means if blood is not being shed, no sins are remitted. Remission means what? Cancellation. Look it up. That's what remission means. Cancellation. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no canceling of sin. Atonement is the act of reconciliation whereby the hostility between God and man is removed. So as Paul says in Ephesians 2, mankind is by nature a child of wrath. You are born in Satan's kingdom. You're not born in God's kingdom. You're not born in between both kingdoms, and then at a certain point after you do something, now you're, you're 
making your choice into one kingdom. No, you are born a fallen son or daughter of Adam, a child of wrath. When one is reconciled to God, that hostility is gone. Which is why the phrase propitiation is so important. Adventist theology proper has to twist this word to mean something that it does not. Propitiation has to do with what was done when the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. So if you study the Old Testament and you understand what was done when the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat, the word propitiation, look it up. The Greek word is hilasterion. That's the transliteration of it. It means to appease wrath. So when Christ tells us that, or, or sorry, when scripture tells us that Christ was a propitiatory sacrifice, that means his sacrifice appeased that wrath that is coming for the wicked. First, or, uh, First Thessalonians 1.10. Instead, Christ satisfied the punishment for his people. This is because God must punish sin. Why? Because he is just. We were talking about the ontological uh, aspect of God earlier, his attributes. One of them is that God is just. Because he is just by nature, he's fair, that means he can't let sin slide, or he wouldn't be just. Think about a judge that would, somebody comes into a, a courtroom, it's verified 100% they are guilty, and he goes, eh, I'll let it slide. He's not a just judge. This is what Romans 3 is getting at when it says God is both the just and the justifier of the one who believes. Notice Romans 3, 21 through 6. Romans 3, 21 through 6. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there's no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Close quote. The evidence that God is righteous was demonstrated in the sacrifice of Jesus at Calvary. And what was he put forth as? a propitiatory sacrifice. And this was the proof that God is holy, righteous, and just, and does not let sin slide. The cross was a revelation to the world that God is who he says he is. That he's just, that he's merciful, that he's uh, all sorts of things. And in doing so, he also justifies those who put their faith in Christ, making God not only just, but the justifier. So when understanding that atonement has to do with reconciliation and the hostility between God and man being eliminated, yes, Scripture does teach that atonement took place at the cross. Really, in the entire spectrum of the work of Christ his sinless life, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, etc. The real issue is not scripture. It's that scripture doesn't fit with the great controversy worldview, so they have to make these outlandish claims and heretical statements. Because at least this guy was smart enough to make the connection that when sin is atoned for, it's removed. Yes, that's exactly correct, sir. The application of the work of Christ on behalf of the sinner takes place at the point of faith. So it isn't that people are born saved, but through faith, God justifies the sinner. 
This also completely falsifies the central governing point of the SDA Great Controversy worldview, which is that God is vindicating his character through a seven-step program called the Sanctuary. No, God vindicated his character, demonstrated he is who he says he is, at Calvary. Furthermore, Continuing in Romans, Paul spends the next chapter talking in Romans 4 talking about justification. He uses Abraham as, as an example. But then notice how he starts chapter 5 as he transitions to discussing reconciliation. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Propitiation. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are, are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Believers are saved from the wrath to come, the same thing that Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, because Christ bore the wrath to come for his people at Calvary. That's what propitiation is. Which is why, through his death, we are reconciled to God. We have received. You got past, present, and future here. Have received reconciliation. Well, according to, to, to W.H. Littlejohn, no, you're not reconciled yet. You can't be reconciled if your sin is still looming and standing against you. That would mean there's still active hostility between God and his people. Reconciliation means that hostility hostility is gone. See ya, goodbye, sayonara. We are also plainly told by Jeremiah regarding the new covenant what one of the promises of the new covenant is, and it's in contrast to the Mosaic covenant. So the author of Hebrews cites Jeremiah 31 in Hebrews 8, 6 through 13. Notice, lot here. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the uh, as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on what? Better promises. For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. For he finds fault with them when he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant, and so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, that's sin, and I will remember their sins no more. In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Once again, when we understand Jude 5 says Jesus led Israel out of the wilderness, here we see Jesus is the one that made the new covenant with his people. Again, demonstrating Jesus is not some lesser Lord or some lesser divine being. He is the Almighty. So the new covenant is a better covenant that the one enacted with or over and against the one enacted with Moses and national Israel because it's enacted on what? Better promises. This is essentially what the author highlights throughout the whole book. All the ways that Jesus is better. But specifically, notice verse 12. 
one of the better promises of the new covenant is that God remembers the sins of those in the covenant no more. Unlike in the Mosaic, where the blood of animals didn't actually atone for sins, they only covered them, which is why they had to keep doing the process over and over and over and had a day of atonement every year. Jesus' holy blood actually atones for sin by taking it away and God remembers it no more. Because what does Hebrews 10.4 say? For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So understand that. The blood of Christ, unlike the blood of animals, takes away sins, which is why it's better than animals. And one of the better promises of the new covenant is that the blood has taken away the sins of those within the covenant, which is why in Hebrews 9, 24 through 6, the author goes on to say this, for Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own, for then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. No, no, but wait. W.H. Littlejohn told us it's contrary to reason to believe that sin was put away at the cross. Because he said atonement didn't take place there, since when sin is atoned for, it's gone and can't be charged to a person's account. I know the guy was physically blind. Maybe that's the problem. Because according to this guy, the first covenant isn't obsolete because a person's sins aren't actually atoned for yet. Just like they weren't in the Mosaic covenant. They're only being covered because they have their whole investigative judgment there's, where sins are standing on record in heaven for Jesus to investigate and deal with. How he's doing that, their scholars can't tell me. I've, I've tried to ask him. I'm like, is he shedding his blood up there? Uh, how did the blood get there? Because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. Yet Hebrews is, is, is clear, as we just saw, Jesus sh suffered the shedding of blood once at Calvary. But in their system, the new covenant's just like the old in this regard. Sin is still remembered, despite the text explicitly saying, God remembers the sins of his people no more because Christ atoned for them at Calvary and put them away. Colossians 1, 19 through 20. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Sin is why there is hostility between God and sinners. But Christ's propitiatory sacrifice appeased God's just condemnation by him punishing sin in the person of Christ, but justifying sinners. And by the blood of Christ's cross, that hostility is removed. There's peace. Adventists love to point to Hebrews 9 to try and say it supports the investigative judgment where it says heaven is also being cleansed. So that proves the investigative judgment's true. Except no, the sacrifice of Christ at Calvary is what did so for both heaven and earth. Not peace by the blood shed at the cross and then halted for 1800 some odd years to then begin in a cleansing work in heaven that will go on from 1844 till whenever where Jesus isn't actually shedding blood, but he's blotting out sins with it in a literal temple building in heaven. No, the sins aren't remembered anymore. That's part of the betterness of the new covenant, and Jesus put sin away at Calvary, making peace by the blood of his cross, and he's seated in heaven, unlike the Levitical priests who never sat down because there was no throne in the temple. They were always standing, working, dealing with sin. Christ is seated in heaven, ruling and reigning as a priest king, a simultaneous work like Melchizedek, 
not standing dealing with sin like the Levites. That is what's actually contrary to reason. Not that atonement took place at the cross. It's contrary to reason, yet the SDA church wants to tell us they're now, they, they now believe atonement took place at the cross. Sort of. Because <laughs> they don't affirm what, what little John said there. Des Ford documents this in his book, Daniel 8, 14, and, and the Investigative Judgment, where he does a systematic representation of this. And that book was before the 21st century. And even in there, he recognizes that from the 19th to the, the 20th century, after this heretic, they're like, well, atonement did take place at the cross, kind of, sort of, which is why their scholars will say stuff like, we believe in a completed, incomplete atonement. It's just never ending confusion and just illogic. It's like, it's part of the reason I can't remain Adventist. It's like, I can't remain just being like having to, having to thwart my, my critical thinking and, and just, this is illogical. It doesn't even make sense. But this is why it's inconsistent for Adventists to claim that they are reconciled to God right now. And you'll often see me asking them that question. Do you have peace with God? That's a leading question I always start with in discussing with SDAs. Are you currently reconciled to God? Because that's the conundrum. No, in that system, you're not. This is something still future to be determined. They don't actually know what the future holds because salvation ultimately comes down to the individual holding up their end of the bargain. Their sins are still looming over them. Despite Paul saying there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, the way the Adventist church defines being in Christ Jesus, there is still condemnation for you, potentially. Next quote, another question and answer in the Review and Herald. The question, will you please favor me with those scriptures which plainly say that Christ is a created being? Answer, you are mistaken in supporting that Seventh-day Adventists teach that Christ was ever created. They believe, on the contrary, that he was begotten of the Father and that he can properly be called God and worshipped as such. They believe also that the worlds and everything which is was created by Christ in conjunction with the Father. They believe, however, that somewhere in the eternal ages of the past, there was a point at which Christ came into existence. Also notice, folks, by worlds, they mean all these other worlds with unfallen beings on them that all keep the Ten Commandments and are looking in on the great controversy, etc. He continues, They think that it is necessary that God should have, have, have adedated Christ in his being in order that Christ could have been begotten of him and sustained to him the relation of son. They hold to the distinct personality of the Father and Son, rejecting as absurd that feature of Trinitarianism which insists that God and Christ and the Holy Spirit are three persons and yet but one person. SDAs hold that God and Christ are one in a sense that Christ prayed for his disciples, might, that his disciples might be one in an example, one in spirit, purpose, and labor. Close quote. So first notice, no mention of the Holy Spirit being involved in creation. Jerry Moon recognizes that same thing in his paper regarding Ellen White. She didn't include the Holy Spirit in the work of creation, which, as we saw, is because she didn't believe the Holy Spirit was a conscious person at the time of writing those things. But this quote is a perfect example of the illogic of Adventism. He says Jesus wasn't created, but at some point in the past, he came into existence. It's like, is it any shock that this movement is a total mess of confusion, Ted? And the evidence that this guy himself was confused is that what he said regarding God being three persons but one person. No, Trinitarians don't believe that. Completely clueless. Yet again, we see the distinction between person and being is so important. But we're the ones that are confused. It's us that are the total confused. Yeah. Notice what this guy says makes the heavenly trio one. Not their being, meaning their mode of existence, but they're united in a mission and a purpose, just like Ted Wilson said in the opening clip. Folks, that is not one God. That's not one God, my friend. I'm not saying that they're not united in their purpose and mission. I am, but that's not ma what makes them one God. 
Jerry Moon and other SDA scholars want to tell us they're Trinitarians and they've reformed, yet in his paper, this is the exact claim he makes about how the heavenly trio is one God. Ultimately, because Ellen White's utilization of John that little John put forth. And by John, I mean the book of John. The way Ellen put, put Jesus forth in the book of John is how little John here, John and little John, that's how John, little John here is using that. So all that to say, Walcott, Hackney, little John, heretic. John G. Madison. Now first notice, folks, what the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists says in part about this guy. Quote, Madison's legacy is vast. Organizing the work in three Scandinavian countries as well as planting numerous Scandinavian churches in the American Midwest from, the, from scratch, spreading the gospel of the love of Jesus through his writings and publishing, as well as teaching and public campaigns. Besides his widespread organizing of the Scandinavian Adventist churches, his legacy was also theological. The deeply evangelical Christocentric focus of his preaching, coupled with a genuine interest in the saving of souls for Jesus, influenced the approach of Adventism in Scandinavia, not the least in Sweden. This focus would remain for most of the hundred plus years ahead. Close quote. Let's look at the Jesus that Mr. Madison was preaching and leading people to. Quote, Christ is the only literal Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, John 1.14. He is God because He is the Son of God, not by virtue of His resurrection. I'm going to repeat this. He is God because He is the Son of God, not by virtue of His resurrection. If Christ is the only begotten of the Father, then we cannot be begotten of the Father in a literal sense. It can only be in a secondary sense of the word. Close quote. So we are going to look at the term begotten. I mentioned it earlier. And this is why I wanted to wait. He says, Jesus is the literal son of God. By this, they mean Jesus was brought forth into being at a point or into, had a beginning at a point in the past. He's not the eternal God, the Almighty. But before doing that, we have to examine how poor yet another one of these pioneers' understanding was. Notice Romans 1, 1 through 4, specifically verse 4. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh. And was, a, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness. How? By His resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. But hold up. John Madison's Jesus, who was conceived at a point in the past and brought forth into existence, was not the Son of God by virtue of the resurrection, but by virtue of being, being brought forth. Eh, wrong. No. Romans, Romans 1 4 says Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection, which means that yes, he is God by virtue of his resurrection. It's like, folks, these were not bright thinkers. This is who God used to raise up and restore the church that never disappeared. Now, when it comes to the word begotten, the Greek word monogenes, it does not mean that Jesus had a beginning. Like these pioneers believed. All anti-Trinitarians try appealing to this. Begotten, but no. Notice this paragraph from Table Talk Magazine. Excellent publication. I cannot recommend it more highly. This is from one of their devotions on specifically begottenness and procession. What makes the three persons of the Trinity differ from one another is a difference in relations, not in attributes. From the early church fathers through the Protestant reformers to today, 
Orthodox Christianity has said that what makes the Father the Father is that he is eternally unbegotten, and what makes the Son the Son is that he is eternally begotten. Evidence for this is found in passages such as John 1.18, which in the King James refers to the Son as begotten. This is a better translation of the Greek than in some newer English, English versions, for the underlying Greek word has to do with generation. The Son is eternally generated by the Father. This generation, or begottenness, never had a beginning. Never had a beginning. The Son has always existed and has always been fully God, even though He is begotten of the Father. And the Father has always begotten the Son, such that the Son and the Father are both fully God. Close quote. So they start by explaining what I did earlier regarding the economic and ontological trinity. Their differences are in relation, not attributes. But then notice the explanation of begotten. It simply means that Jesus eternally proceeds from the Father, which the SDA church to this day still rejects. What is called eternal procession or eternal generation of the Son. The eternal proceeding forth from the Father of the Son. This is why it is wrong to say that Jesus is self-existent, like Ellen White erroneously claimed. No, he is not. The, what's self-existent is the one God, Father, Son, and Spirit. You're dividing them at the wrong level. You're dividing them ontologically, not economically. The point being, the term begotten does not mean that Jesus had a beginning like Uriah Smith tried saying meant in the quotes we looked at earlier. It doesn't. This discussion is not new to the 19th century. It is old, folks, long before the SDAs. Which is why I constantly say these folks simply resurrected a bunch of ancient heresy that God already led the church through and then tries to claim like a thousand years later no, 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 we're resurrecting truth. Wow, okay. So John G. Madison, heretic. J.H. Wagner, Joseph Wagner. He was close with uh, James White. He was the editor of uh, Signs of the Times for a while. Notice what he says regarding the Trinity and the Atonement. Many theologians really think that the atonement in respect to its dignity and efficacy rests upon the doctrine of the Trinity. But we fail to see any connection between the two. To the contrary, the advocates of that doctrine really fall into the difficulty which they seem anxious to avoid. Their difficulty consists of this. They take the denial of a Trinity to be equivalent to a denial of the divinity of Christ. Were that the case, we should cling to the doctrine of a trinity as tenaciously as they can, but it is not the case. They who have read our remarks on the death of the Son of God know that we firmly believe in the divinity of Christ, but we cannot accept the idea of a trinity as it is held by Trinitarians without giving up our claim on the dignity of the sacrifice made for our redemption. Close quote then I guess the SDA church gave up their claim on the dignity of the sacrifice made for redemption because they claim to be Trinitarians now and will assure us they believe like Christians do. This is the favorite excuse of all the Arian-leaning SDAs. They'll tell you, no, no, we believe Jesus is divine. We believe Jesus is God. But he's not the eternal God, the Almighty. <laughs> Which means you either have two gods or one that is a lesser divine being, and the other the Almighty, or that Jesus isn't God. No amount of mental gymnastics will fix this. The real issue that this heretic wasn't bright enough to actually recognize is that while it does have implications for Christ's atonement, the far more pressing issue is that by rejecting the Trinity, you have a different God. <laughs> Lowercase g, an idol that's not real. Because the triune God is the only true God. And he's revealed himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. The singular name that someone is baptized in. Not names, but name. 
the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit. That's the one God. These heretics have a different God entirely. The Holy Spirit isn't personal, meaning has the ability to will, speak, and be spoken to. The Son's not the almighty eternal God, but a lesser divine being. He's not created, but he had a beginning. Which means, no, you're not the commandment keepers. You're violating all four of the first commandments, which are all God-facing. And you have a false God violating the first commandment specifically. All the dominoes now fall. Now he's going to explain his last sentence of that quote regarding Trinitarians apparently having to give up the, the dignity of the atonement. And here is shown how remarkably the widest extremes meet in theology. The highest Trinitarians and lowest Unitarians meet and are perfectly united on the death of Christ. The faith of both amounts to Socinianism. Unitarians believe that Christ was a prophet, an inspired teacher, but merely human. That his death was that of a human body only. Trinitarians hold that the term Christ comprehends two distinct and separate natures, one that was merely human, the other the second person of the Trinity who dwelt in the flesh for a brief period, but could not possibly suffer or die, that the Christ that died was only the human nature in which the divinity had dwelt. Both classes have a human offering and nothing more. No matter how exalted the pre-existent son was, no matter how glorious, how powerful, or even eternal, if the manhood only died, the sacrifice was only human. And so far as the, the vicarious death of Christ is concerned, this is Socinianism. Thus the remark is just that the doctrine of a trinity degrades the atonement, resting it solely on a human offering as a basis. Close quote. No, what degrades the atonement is saying no atonement took place at the cross. These flaming heretics. But this really says it all. This guy claims that when it comes to the atonement, Trinitarians and Unitarians are united. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, folks. It just Trinitarians and Unitarians are united because both parties only believe Christ sacrifices. <laughs> Sorry, man. It's just hard to take this stuff seriously. It's like, then he makes the laughable assertion that both amount to Socinianism. <laughs> it's coming from the movement that handles the Bible exactly like the Socinians completely detaching it from history, the same movement that assert, asserts no creed but the Bible. <laughs> I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> the same movement that's a, a total theological free-for-all. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. The movement that claims no creed but the Bible, just like the Socinians, which is why the Socinians were a total theological free-for-all, completely untethered from Christian history, went totally rogue as a novel sect that ended up embracing all sorts of ancient heresy. Gee, exactly like the SDA church. <laughs> to make the charge that Unitarians, which is what the Socinians were, and Trinitarians affirm the same thing regarding the atonement? For starters, he said, Trinitarians affirm that Jesus dwelt in the flesh for a brief period. Uh, uh, no, sir. Trinitarians. Trinitarians, which is the classical Christian position, believe that Jesus will forever retain his physical resurrected glorified body and will dwell with his people in union as such forever this is literally central to our theology around the incarnation it's implicit in what we put forth regarding jesus's priesthood being a forever work 
something I'm constantly bringing up regarding the investigative judgment being a blasphemous heretical doctrine, which it's claimed that Jesus will cease his work as mediator at a point in the future. Not even close. Hebrews 7 is clear. Jesus is a priest forever. This was foretold of in the Psalter. And that he lives forever to make intercession for his people. This speaks to the incarnation as Jesus incarnating was God bridging the gap between God and man. The word, the second person of the God had added unto himself human flesh. In him, the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. This is how Jesus is forever our mediator between God and man, because the fullness of God himself added unto himself human flesh, came down to our level, what's called the condescension of Christ, and he remains with the physical glorified body that he resurrected in forever to stay with us. So this guy had no clue what he was talking about and didn't even realize that Trinitarians are not Gnostics. We don't believe Jesus is some disembodied spirit. He's the God-man. Then he tried to say Trinitarians and Unitarians both only have a human offering taking place. This is supposed to be how uh, we're united with Unitarians when it comes to the atonement. Yeah, no, dude. When Trinitarians say only Jesus' human nature died, that doesn't mean his sacrifice was not of divine value. When Trinitarians say only Jesus' human nature died, they are essentially saying God can't die. That's why his divine nature didn't die, because God can't die. That doesn't mean that his sacrifice as a man was not still of divine value. That's the kicker, which makes his criticism completely null and void. His logical syllogism is this. If only Jesus' human nature died, and not his divine human nature, then it was only a human offering. No, bad logic. That's a faulty syllogism. His human sacrifice of his human body, his human bodily nature, made the atonement for humans possible, but wasn't totally unique in so much as it was, a, uh, it was of divine value by nature because Christ was fully divine as well. The divine nature cannot die because God by nature can't die. Christ's divinity did not need to die in order for the sacrifice of the whole person of Christ to be what was offered. Death is a human attribute, not a divine attribute. And this shows you they don't understand the hypostatic union. The two natures of Christ are ascribed to the single person, one person. You can't divide the two natures. That's why you get all these other heresies that popped up the ch that the church had to deal with. Well, Christ has has is two natures, two persons. No, he's not. But since these pioneers didn't understand this, the two natures of Christ, and how that's arrived at from Scripture, they brought these totally useless critiques that don't even hit the mark. This coming from the same people who are going to cite 1 Timothy 6.16 to say only God has immortality? To be consistent, they'd have to say that only applies to the Father, not Jesus. Because if Jesus was human and divine, and both natures died, Jesus isn't the Almighty, but a lesser God with the capability of his divinity dying. Which is precisely what the SDA Church still affirms to this day. <laughs> they believe that when Jesus died, just like they believe about every other human, he ceased to exist for three days. I brought this up in SDA University, in a religion class, to Judd Lake. And he admitted it creates problems regarding scripture, clearly stating that the universe is upheld by Christ and that God can't die. But notice what Ellen White says. Jesus said to Mary, touch me not for I am not yet ascended to my father. When he closed his eyes in death upon the cross, the soul of Christ did not go, to go at once to heaven, as many believe. Or how could his words be true? I am not yet ascended to my father. The spirit of Jesus slept in the tomb with his body. And did not wing its way to heaven. There to maintain a separate existence and to look down upon the mourning disciples embalming the body from which it had taken flight. 
all that comprised the life and intelligence of Jesus remained with his body in the sepulcher. And when he came forth, it was as a whole being. He did not have to summon his spirit from heaven. He had power to lay down his life and to take it up again. Close quote. Folks, God does not sleep. This is a human attribute. Yet she claims that Jesus slept in the tomb. All that comprised him that was laid in the tomb was no different than any other human. Except, no, Jesus is the unique incarnate one. He's fully divine and fully human. Yes, with two natures. And the modern SDA church tries to affirm this now. Which is precisely why the anti-heavenly trio folks in their ranks are arguing with them, claiming they have apostatized from the roots of the pioneers, uh, which was correct, supposedly. The point being, no, Jesus' divine nature did not die. This is part of why the incarnation is such an important doctrine. When you affirm the kenosis heresy like the SDA church does, this is the problem you run into. The kenosis heresy is the claim that Jesus set his divinity aside when he incarnated and was only a man while on earth. Except no, divine attributes are ascribed to the single person, which is both human and divine. After he added unto himself divinity, you can't divide the two natures. I'm sorry, you can't do that. And to claim that the Christian church has been confused on this for 2,000 years, no, you're a fool to say something like this. You don't know what you're talking about. But now, because we have to demonstrate this with sources, What's my source for this? Notice, what does the SDA Church's website say on a page titled, What Adventists Believe About the Life, Death, and Resurrection of Christ? Notice. Let me zoom in here for you. What does it say? Jesus came to experience life as we do, as 100% human. Out of love for every single one of us, he chose to be stripped of his glory, Philippians 2, 6 through 8, and was given no advantage over us when it came to living a life without sinning. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1, 14, but this made him no less divine. Jesus was still 100% God. This concept that Jesus is, and then they bold it, 100% God and 100% man, can be mind-boggling, but this was necessary in God's plan to deliver us from the grip of sin while the great controversy rages on, meaning both good and evil surround us daily, warring against one another. So Jesus, as part of the Godhead, had to live a perfect life. Then his innocent blood could cover our sins and make it possible for us to inherit eternal life. Notice, cover sins. What did we see in in Hebrews earlier about what makes the new covenant better? No, it's not just covered like the blood of bulls and goats. Removed. You still see the pioneers' ideas undergirding all of this. But they continue. Notice, Philippians 2, 6 through 8, says that even though Jesus is God, he set his divine nature aside and took on human nature. He came to serve us to show us God's love for us to live as our example. He came to minister to people through his perfect obedient life. He obeyed the Father in every way, even when it led to hum- to a humiliating death on a cross. Notice, they try and pay lip service to the hypostatic union, that Jesus is 100% God, 100% man. He's the God man. But then they went on to say what? About Philippians 2, 6 through 12, or 6 through 8, technically. That upon incarnating, he set his divinity aside. This is the kenosis interpretation of Philippians 2, which is a heresy. The glory of Christ was indeed veiled, like they said in the first paragraph in his incarnation, but he did not set aside his divine nature. There's a difference there. Divine attributes are ascribed to the incarnate Christ. He didn't set that aside. As we saw, he forgave sins. Only God can forgive sins. If he was only a man while on earth, he couldn't forgive sins. 
But what we see here is the fruit of these heretical pioneers trying to be merged with the more modern understanding and some branches of SDA leadership trying to embrace certain aspects of orthodoxy. No, sorry, does not work that way. That results in contradictions, which is exactly what that section of the webpage says. The hypostatic union and the kenosis, her uh, kenosis heresy are not compatible. Yet they're trying to play both sides, creating contradictions. And this is why you don't come along in the 19th century and think you're smarter than everyone else that came before you. They were all stooges of the Roman Catholic Church with the Trinity only being accepted because, well, the winners of history wrote the history. No, the Trinity poses zero problems for the atonement, nor are Trinitarians functionally Socinian when it comes to the atonement. Tell us you don't understand Socinianism and Trinitarianism without telling us that you don't know either. So this guy, J.H. Wagner, certified heretic. His son, E.J. Wagner. Lots of Adventists love to point to this guy and his efforts in justification by faith, which they don't mean the same thing Christians do, to say Adventism, since Wagner, is different. They got the gospel right. Yeah, well, unfortunately, when you're a Christological heretic, you can't possibly have the gospel correct. Because the gospel is Jesus Christ's gospel, according to Galatians 1.12. Which means if you have the wrong Jesus, you don't have his gospel. Notice, Signs of the Times, April 8, 1889, the year immediately after the 1888 Minneapolis General Conference debacle regarding justification by faith. Quote, while both are of the same nature, the Father is the first in point of time. He's also greater in that he had no beginning, while Christ's personality had a beginning. Close quote. Look at the year, folks. 1889. This blasphemous heresy is still around and being taught by SDA authority figures up to the turn of the century. Uh, no, they don't possess the same nature then, Wagner. This is insight into how SDA theology even has a, use, a unique understanding of what nature means. And remember, in this system's theology, person means having a literal, tangible form. What he is not saying is that Jesus began to exist at his physical birth, but that at a point in the past, before the creation of the earth, Jesus was brought forth into being. The Father alone had no beginning. Just like these other heretics we looked at. This is damnable heresy. It's a false Christ. Jesus Christ is Yahweh, folks. Jehovah. This idea of breaking apart the Godhead into different parts like this creates two issues you've had with Adventism from their inception. You either have the Father being the Supreme and the Son being inferior and the Holy Spirit not even being a person. Or you get where they are now, which is functionally tritheism, where they try and claim that the three persons are co-equal, co-eternal, but Jesus still lacks certain divine attributes, such as omnipresence. He's present through the Holy Spirit, who now they claim is a person, but is the person of the Father and the Spirit's or, or the Son's presence in their physical absence. Despite saying, despite Jesus saying God is spirit and spirit is immaterial. These pioneers, to, to them, immaterial meant not real, which again is due to their physicalist worldview. The point being, no, Jesus had no beginning as the Father, Son, and Spirit are the eternal God, the true God. E.J. Wagner, certified heretic. Last but not least, obviously no stranger, the prophetess. Now, in the last funeral stream, folks, we looked at a number of statements and quotes from her. We're going to look at some others now, because at the end of the day, she holds more weight and authority than anyone else we've looked at thus far and any living Adventist to this day. You know, I recently had a guy reach out about asking about SDA theology. He talked to me about it, and then he went and talked to a bunch of SDA, SDA theologians. He got taken for a ride. He, he got totally bamboozled. Poor guy. Tried to tell him. I'm like, dude, you got hoodwinked. You got hoodwinked. Because he tried to appeal to, well, these scholars say this. Yeah, it, that doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. 
What matters is the ultimate authority sources. What matters is the great controversy theme. What matters is what Ellen White says. She holds far more authority than any, anybody else. So we're going to pay particular attention this time to the great controversy narrative and look at how much of this mess and confusion is rooted in that and part of why eradicating this from the movement will essentially be an impossible feat without wiping out the whole house of cards. Okay? From the great controversy. But it's also in the SDA Bible commentary. Quote, before the entrance of sin among the angels, Christ the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father. One in nature, in character, and in purpose. The only being in all of the universe that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. By Christ, the Father wrought in the creation of all heavenly beings. Close quote. So what do they mean by begotten? Christ had a beginning at a point in the past. The Father is the Eternal One, the Eternal Father. Yet just like E.J. Wagner, she says the Father and Jesus are one in nature. But the Father's the Eternal One. Remember, three great powers. Plural, like we saw toward the beginning. Not one power. Adventists will point to statements like this and say, see, see, she says they're of the same nature, thinking that fixes things. But no, it doesn't. Adam and Eve had the same nature, yet they were still two different persons, two different beings. They were not two persons, one being. Which is why in the very next sentence, she says Jesus was the only being in all the universe that could enter into God's, uh, God the Father's counsels. And as we saw earlier, that's the act that made Lucifer jealous. I've had SDA pastors try and tell me that SDA theology proper understands the distinction between person and being. It's only the laity of their movement that interchangeably use the two terms. Yet here we have their own prophetess doing such. Because either you have to say she distinguishes the father and the son in being, which is damnable heresy, or you have to try and use the SDA defense that uh, she was using, person and being interchangeably which circles us back to the issue. Person and being are not the same thing. There's no reconciling statements like this with Trinitarianism. They need to just own that they're their own thing and stand confidently on that idea and that they have this special revelation that no one else has that gives them the answers to everything. And they're here to correct everyone, which is exactly what Herbert Douglas said. In the paper we've looked at, Ministry Magazine 2000, December 2000, where he says the the great controversy theme is the God particle. It is the theory of everything. That's why Adventism has the antidote to theological division. Yeah. Except they try and play word games and insist that they're Trinitarians when their scholars outright state that they reject Orthodox Trinitarianism and don't mean what Christians do when they say that. They've taken the word to appear like the rest of us, which is dishonest. Commandment keeping church. It knowingly confuses people. They need to stick to the heavenly trio label. But again, in the same vein. Quote, Satan was envious and jealous of Jesus Christ. Christ had been taken into the special counsel of God in regard to his plans. While Satan was unacquainted with them, he did not understand, neither was he permitted to know the purposes of God. But Christ was acknowledged sovereign of heaven, his power and authority to be the same as that of God himself. Satan thought that he himself a favor of heaven among the angels. Satan thought that he was himself a favor in heaven among the angels. He had been highly exalted, but this did not call forth from him gratitude and praise to his creator. He aspired to the height of God himself. He glorified in his loftiness. He knew that he was honored by the angels. He had a special mission to execute. He had been near the great creator and the ceaseless beams of glorious light enshrouded the eternal God or the the, the ceaseless beams that enshrouded the, the eternal God had shown especially upon him. Satan thought how angels had, had obeyed his command with pleasurable alacrity. Were not his garments light and beautiful? 
why should Christ thus be honored before him? Close quote. So Satan was jealous of Jesus. Why? Because the Father, who is the eternal God, chose to take Jesus into his special counsel regarding his plans regarding the creation of the earth. The Father's plan. The Father's plan. Jesus was unfamiliar with these until he was let in on the action. He was exalted to be made equal with the Father, having the same authority as his Father. Which would mean he didn't possess omnipotence, or rather omniscience, from eternity past. That is distinct to the Father. This action on the Father's part caused Satan to begin asking why he wasn't the one that was done, that, that this wasn't done to. He thought all the angels loved him and he was so beautiful, he was in close contact with the ceaseless beams of light shining forth from God the Father. They shone especially upon him. So why was Jesus honored before him? Have an Adventist show you this in the Bible, folks. They can't. They'll point to Ezekiel, where it simply says Lucifer was filled with pride. None of this story about him being jealous because Jesus was exalted. Total fiction. Jesus was not exalted to be made equal with the Father. Jesus created Lucifer. <laughs> he was never given some extra power and authority he didn't always possess that caused Lucifer, a creature, to now become jealous. This is why the SDA view of the Godhead is a divided mess. They'll try and say, no, 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 we believe Jesus is God. Look, yet what they mean by that isn't that he's Yahweh from eternity past and into eternity. He isn't omnipresent. He lacks all sorts of divine attributes that only the Father has, which shows that the term God in SDA theology more closely resembles a familial title, not a statement of ontological being or state of existence. But then she continues the narrative where she reiterates the same thing again. All the heavenly host were summoned to appear before the Father to have each case determined. Satan unblushingly made known his dissatisfaction that Christ should be preferred before him. Preferred before him for what? Oh, exaltation. He stood up proudly and urged that he should be equal with God. Oh, right, because Jesus was made equal with God and should be taken into conference with the Father and understand his purposes. God informed Satan that his son alone, he would reveal his secret purposes. That to his son. And he required all the family in heaven, even Satan, to yield him in implicit, unquestionable obedience, but that, the, that he, Satan, had proved himself unworthy a place in heaven. Close quote. None of this is in scripture, yet they'll emphatically tell you, we only believe the Bible. No, you're kidding yourself. But notice the interaction. She claims that God told her, this is before the creation of the earth. God the Father calls all the angelic hosts before him. After the announcement that Jesus has been made equal with the Father and is to be obeyed, Satan supposedly unblushingly made known his dissatisfaction with this and claimed to be shown that he had been or, or claimed he should have been the one that this happened to. But then the father told him that only Jesus would be revealed the secret counsels and purposes of the father. Does that sound like omniscience, folks? Does that sound like, uh, well, we'll get to it in a moment. The Adventist Jesus apparently isn't omniscient either because he gained new insight and information after the Father decided at a point in the past to elevate him and give him access he didn't previously have. Even though he's God, they'll insist. Like Ted said, we believe three co-eternal uh, persons. Yeah, no, you don't. That's just Christianese to try and sound like you're Trinitarians. Well, maybe they'll say now, well, Jesus is eternal. We disagree with the pioneers that he had a, he had a beginning in the past. He's co-eternal. Yeah, he's not Yahweh. And as we've seen, the highest source of authority in their movement distinguishes Jesus as a distinct being from the Father that was exalted to be made equal with the Father, given an exalted status that included gaining new information and insights that he previously did not have. 
After all this transpires, she claims that Lucifer continued in his rebellion in heaven, was then booted to the earth after its creation, kicked out of heaven. Adam and Eve were created on the earth as a probationary test to see if they would stand or fall. Satan then tempts Eve, she sins, and then is used by Satan as a false messenger to go tempt Adam, who she also says was deceived, despite scripture saying Adam wasn't deceived, who then went on and sinned as well. We've looked at how she botches Genesis, I don't even know how many times at this point. But after all that happens, then she had this to say. Sorrow filled heaven. This is after the fall of man. As it was realized that man was lost and the world that God created was to be filled with mortals doomed to misery, sickness, and death, and there was no way of escape for the offender. The whole family of Adam must die. I saw the lovely Jesus and behold an expression of sympathy and sorrow upon his countenance. Soon I saw him approach the exceeding bright light which enshrouded the Father. Said my accompanying angel, He's in close converse with his father. The anxiety of the angels seemed to be intense while Jesus was communing with his father. Three times he was shut in by the glorious light about the father, and the third time he came from the uh, and, and the third time he came from the father, his person could be seen. His countenance was calm, free from all perplexity and trouble, and shone with benevolence and loveliness, such as words cannot express. He then made known to the angelic host that a way of escape had been made for lost man. Had been made. Not a plan from eternity past. He told them that he had been pleading with his father and had offered to give his life a ransom and take the sentence of death upon himself that through him man might find pardon. That through the merits of his blood and obedience to the law of God, they could have favor with God and be brought into the beautiful garden and eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Close quote. So now that man fell, the Adventist Jesus proposed a plan to the father that took three tries for him to accept. Jesus had to plea with him. Yet Jerry Moon told us in his paper that if there's division in the purpose or plan of the three heavenly trio members, that would be polytheism. <laughs> Yet here you have them apparently not in agreement. Jesus had to plea with the Father to accept a plan? Totally ludicrous. And again, this is now an afterthought, clearly. It's not a plan from eternity past like Peter's preaching in the book of Acts. The plan that God had always had to work out where the son was always going to be. And notice, she diminishes Christ by saying the father couldn't be seen. His glory was too great to behold, but ah, Jesus, nah, he could be seen. These are all the ways that evidence that no, they're not Trinitarians. They have a different Jesus. This is a serious issue. But this is in the chapter of the book titled, The Plan of Salvation. <laughs> After man fell, Jesus proposes a plan for man to be redeemed, which involved Jesus incarnating, giving his life a ransom to give mankind a second probation, like Adam and Eve were on. And then through the merits of Christ's blood and their obedience to the Ten Commandments, man could be returned to a position of favor with God, eventually returning to Eden. Sorry, Adventists, eternity is not a return to Eden. Nor are the Ten Commandments how one has favor with God. This is a false gospel and a false Christ. And just to further demonstrate that, yes, Jesus proposed a plan that the Father apparently wasn't already aware of, which is why Jesus was pleading. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 47, same book. She goes on to say, Jesus bade the heavenly host to be reconciled to the plan that his Father accepted and rejoiced that fallen man could be exalted again through his death to obtain favor with God and enjoy heaven. Close quote. What did she say two pages earlier was what brought favor with God? Obedience to the Ten Commandments plus Jesus' merits. And this plan was accepted by the Father. That's not how Paul describes reconciliation like we saw earlier. There are so many Christological issues with all of this. 
very clearly, the Father and the Son don't share in the same knowledge. They have a level of separation at that level that does not comport with the Trinitarianism. The triune God is not divided like this. But after this happens, now notice what she claims regarding Satan in his response to this plan, three pages later. Satan again rejoiced with his angels that he could, by causing man's fall, pull down the Son of God from his exalted position. He told his angels that when Jesus should take fallen man's nature, he could overpower him and hinder the accomplishment of the plan of salvation. Close quote. No, no, no. She didn't teach that Jesus was exalted to be made equal with the Father. She just repeatedly said that he was and that after Satan tempted man in Eden, he rejoiced because he felt he was able to what? Pull Jesus down from his exalted position. This is prior to the creation of the earth, folks. <laughs> this is not Jesus as a man at post-incarnation. No. There was an exalted position, like James White recognized earlier because of Ellen and what we just read, where Jesus was exalted prior to the creation of the earth, then incarnates, and then there's another exaltation as a man where he's exalted. This is after God the Father calls together the heavenly host to make the announcement and confer special honor onto Jesus, page 17, making him equal with himself. This is after Satan was jealous of this exaltation and wondered why he wasn't the one chosen to be exalted. Yeah, because he's a creature and Jesus is Yahweh. Jesus was never exalted to be made equal with Yahweh when he's Yahweh. Yes, very clearly over and over, this narrative revolves around the Adventist Jesus being exalted to be made equal with the Father, Lucifer being jealous, rebelling, attacking the character of God, which they mean the Ten Commandments, and starting the great controversy, which is the central hinge of their entire worldview. Jesus being exalted to be made equal with the Father is central to the whole paradigm. Yet it's not true. It's a different Jesus that's not real, an idol, a figment of this woman's imagination that was clearly influenced by Joseph Smith and John Milton, Paradise Lost. But more evidence of the divided, confused Adventist heavenly trio, as well as the false Christ of Adventism. This is her commentary immediately after the resurrection. Notice what she says. Quote, supposing that he was the gardener, she begged him, talking about Mary, if he had borne away her Lord, to tell her where he had laid him and that she might take him away. Jesus spoke to her with his own heavenly voice, saying, Mary, she was acquainted with the tones of that dear voice and quickly answered, Master, and in her joy was about to embrace him. But Jesus said, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God, John 20, 17. Joyfully, she hastened to the disciples with the good news. Jesus quickly ascended to his Father to hear from his lips that he accepted the sacrifice and to receive all power in heaven and on earth. Close quote. So after he resurrected, the Adventist Jesus didn't know if his sacrifice had been accepted. This is supposedly why in John 20, 17, Jesus told Mary not to cling to him. Because he didn't know yet if his sacrifice was accepted and if he was worthy of worship. So he secretly ascended to heaven and had to hear from the lips of the Father that it was accepted. Again, God the Father now has lips. He has parts. Because the Adventist father is basically a man. But again, we see that the Adventist Jesus is not omniscient. <laughs> Furthermore, Ellen White had an abysmal understanding of Scripture. Because like we saw earlier in Romans 1.4, Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection. Outside of the fact that Jesus himself said definitively that he would resurrect himself, his sacrifice was obviously accepted because if it wasn't, he wouldn't have been resurrected. <laughs> he would have been just like any other sinner that never resurrects yet until Christ resurrects the, the, the fallen person. He would have remained in the tomb and it would have been evident that he was, it would have been evidence that he was a fraud. 
But the fact that he did resurrect proved he was who he said he was, the divine son of God, the one whom the scriptures foretold of, God in flesh, who would come and establish his everlasting kingdom, redeem the fallen creation, and rule and reign supreme forever in all of the universe, all of creation. He would be supreme in union with his people forever. We didn't look at any of those verses, which we could have. All the various places in the Old Testament that talk about Yahweh coming. Yahweh's going to come and establish his kingdom. He's going to rule and reign with a dominion and everlasting kingdom that knows no ends. All of that stuff is then said in the New, New Testament about Jesus. Furthermore, Scripture knows nothing about two ascension events. Ellen should have, should have cross-referenced more carefully because Mary falls down and does touch Jesus at the same event that Ellen's commenting on, but not in John, in the accounting in Matthew 28. She clings to his feet, it says. It's very obvious that Jesus was saying to not cling to him because he was on a divine timeline. His ascension had yet to take place. He had to be seen by the eyewitnesses, etc. He had a schedule. He didn't just resurrect and it's like, oh, okay. Woo. All right. Now what? No, he, he still had a, he was on a divine timeline in the incarnation, post-resurrection. He's still on a timeline. So he's saying, I haven't ascended yet. I'm on a timeline. Not, don't touch me. I have to find out if I, uh, my sacrifice was even accepted. He wasn't telling them he's not worthy of worship because he hadn't heard if his sacrifice was accepted from the lips of the father. Which is why most modern translations will say he told them not to cling to him. And the word cling has to do with holding in place. They were obstructing the agenda, basically. Not something about him lacking knowledge. But speaking of these two ascensions, let's not forget the Adventist Jesus had multiple second comings, too. The SDA church's big focus is supposed to be the second coming. Look at this. Quote, in the days of the early Christians, Christ came the second time. His first advent was at Bethlehem when he came as an infant. His second advent was at the Isle of Patmos when he revered himself or revealed himself in glory to John the Revelator, who fell at his feet as dead when he saw him. Close quote. So technically, Patmos should have been the third coming. The second would have been his secret ascension after the resurrection to find out if he actually was who he said he was. And then if you read the, the, the I, I read from the story of redemption quote there, but if you read the parallel of it in Desire of Ages, she says, and then he returned into a sin, uh, a sin-ridden world to, to, you know, to see the disciples. Okay, well, that would have been his second coming. His third coming then would have been this visit to Patmos. So the SDA church should be all about the fourth coming, not the second. As if it even needs said, Ellen G. White, arch heretic. Because she went so far as to make the silly decision to attribute her foolishness to God and violate the third commandment repeatedly. But to circle back around to our thesis, this was who God raised up to restore his church? That mess? We just scratched the surface. We didn't even talk about all the other subjects. No, the God of scripture, his church never, never became totally apostate, needed to be restored. We're going to be talking about the preservation of the church here coming up quickly because it's not just SDAs that, that make this, this charge. You've then got the inverse charge, which is often made by our Roman Catholic friends, Orthodox friends, that that's what Protestants believe. When, no, that's not what Protestants believe. And even if it did, he didn't use Christological anti-Trinitarian heretics that didn't even believe in him to do that effort. Folks, you have modern SDA scholarship, such as Jerry Moon, arguing that the pioneers grew over time and changed, including Ellen White. You have the anti-heavenly trio proponents claiming that's false, which is why within Adventism, you have confusion at such a fundamental level as to who it is they even worship. But since they were too prideful and had to reinvent the wheel, claiming everyone else is just a dunce of Roman Catholicism, they ended up producing rotten fruit for decades now, a total mess at the fundamental level. When the SDA church tries to tell us that they are the commandment-keeping church, no, you're not. No, you're not. You're kidding yourselves. You think, oh, look, see, we keep the seventh-day Sabbath, and, and none of them do, so they, they agree with nine. And 
No, you are kidding yourselves. You're kidding yourselves. They are a sect that uses Christian language and proof texts from all over the Bible to try and uphold the imagination of a woman from the 19th century that claimed to be in direct communication with God, who was also a product of her time. They have a false God even to this day. Both the pioneers and the modern day, you have two idols going back and forth, butting heads, which means they're in violation of all four of the first of the Ten Commandments, which are all God facing. They have an idol that they proselytize, a Jesus that was only a man while on earth who was exalted to be made equal with the Father prior to the creation of the earth. That's not actually the Almighty. Because when they say the Father and the Son have the same nature, they don't mean equality shared in attribution. As we saw, he's not a Jesus. The Adventist Jesus isn't actually omniscient. He turned that off like a light switch. It's like, do you understand the problems that that would create? It's like that would mean that Jesus could then do other things that just are completely against who he is by nature. <laughs> they can't say this without saying Ellen White was wrong. That's the problem, which will never happen. So instead, they weave all sorts of theological webs and play a bunch of word games, hoping to catch as many unsuspecting flies as possible, who then get tangled in that web and can't see their way out. Which is why, in part, this platform exists. We are cutting through the SDA theological fog to make these distinctions more clear and to highlight the theological dangers of this movement to Christians. The general level of awareness has got to raise, folks. We got millions of people here on our, uh, uh, a dangerous pathway. Are all Adventists lost? No. But this platform is dealing with the organization, the official stated beliefs. Not all SDAs are bad people. That's not what we're saying here. Contrary to the plethora, and when I say plethora, I mean plethora of hate mail that we receive weekly that says the contrary. We don't hate SDAs, not even close. It's the exact opposite. I'm willing to shoot the, you know, shoot the truth to you straight, trusting that God will use it for his purposes. And it's really as simple as that. If Adventists were honest, they would say, yes, you're an apostate, Miles, and you're lost. One of us is brave enough to actually say the quiet part out loud and shoot it straight, knowing that it's going to lead to all sorts of vitriol and anger sent my direction. You're doing this to be famous. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is what you, yeah. But despite that, I'm still firm enough in my conviction and care for SDAs that I want them to come know the truth. That's what this is actually about. Not being famous, not dogging on SDAs. We want you to come to know the true God, the true gospel. You can't divorce those two things from one another. If you have a false God, you got a false gospel. Because the gospel, Galatians 1.12, is the true God's gospel. And if you have a false Christ, you don't have the true God. Which is why this area, as well as the gospel, Christology, all of that stuff is interconnected. That's the foundation of the Christian faith, folks. The Apostles' Creed. It is Trinitarian in nature. The three stanzas talk about the three persons, etc. This is the foundation of the Christian faith. We've got to be reaching Adventists with the truth. We've got to be. I hope tonight was beneficial for you. It was long. This is probably the longest stream to date. But it was necessary. No, the SDA church is not Trinitarian. They never have been. And what they've shifted to now is just a different idol because they're refusing to spray the theological... Uh, theological glyphosate on the roots of the movement because they know what that will result in. May the triune God continue to use this platform for his glory and draw many who are being deceived by this movement out of it into the truth. 
Just want to remind you guys, you can join our members section that is newly on the channel. If you just go to our YouTube homepage, there will be a button there that says join. You can click that join, get access to exclusive content. We will be adding uh, more tiers, what they're called, uh, various levels that you can join at that will have various perks, etc. Definitely check that out. Come connect with us. I want to get involved uh, more with you all in the uh, members community section on there, if you will. Um, yeah. As always, until next time, God bless.